Those topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion 1223 in the name of Michael Russell on the European Union Withdrawal Bill UK legislation. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on Michael Russell to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, when Donald Dewar spoke at the opening of the Scottish Parliament, the reopening, as he himself acknowledged, on the 1st of July 1999, he talked of it being a new stage on a journey begun long ago and which has no end. Presiding Officer, you were there to hear that speech. So was I. So were the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister sitting on this front bench today. So were Tavish Scott and Mike Rumbles. So was Ian Gray and Elaine Smith. 26 members of this present parliament were, so to speak, in at the beginning. Though the beginning was actually a culmination of a long campaign and struggle, which was fought, again in Donald Dewar's words, to achieve the day when doc democracy was renewed in Scotland. Of course, I and all the others on these benches disagreed then with Donald Dewar about the final destination of that journey, just as we disagree on that matter with others here today. Yet that was not the important thing on that opening day, and it's not the important thing today. The important thing was, and is, to acknowledge the progress that had and has been made. To accept that on this journey together in a parliament of minorities, a journey the Scottish people told us to take, and which they voted for by an overwhelming majority, we should find a way to secure tangible gains for our country, no matter our vision of where we wanted to end up. That's our duty because this Scottish Parliament belongs to the people of Scotland, not to us as parliamentarians, nor to this government or any government. As elected members, we hold this place and our powers in trust for the generations that voted for them, for this generation, and for the generations to come. They decide on journey and end point, not us. Presiding officer, over the past 19 years, this Scottish Parliament has, in the greatest part, been good for Scotland. The powers of the Scottish Parliament have been used by administrations of different political complexions to improve the lives of many, hopefully most, of the people living in Scotland, often in response to some of the most serious challenges they face. Every one of us in this chamber has played a part in that, from securing free personal care for the elderly to abolishing tuition fees, from establishing world-leading climate change legislation to delivering equal marriage, from putting in place the UK's first smoking ban to agreeing that for the health of our nation, we should introduce minimum unit pricing for alcohol, from eliminating business rates on small enterprises to supporting innovative and profitable renewable energy generation. We have and we use these powers because we enjoy an established system of government called devolution. It may not be able to secure everything all of us want, but devolution put in place in 1999 and strengthened by subsequent agreement with Westminster has made our system of governance robust enough to withstand expected and unexpected challenge and difficulty, robust enough to withstand a global financial crash and to resist, at least in part, the misguided and damaging policy of austerity. Now it's our job to ensure that it is not cast aside because of a Brexit which Scotland did not vote for and which can only be damaging to our country. Today, the challenge of Brexit, or rather the challenge of the proposed power grab by the UK Tory government under the guise of delivering Brexit, puts our devolved settlement at risk. The Secretary of State for Scotland, who incidentally also heard Donald Dewar's opening remarks as a member of this parliament, dismissively described the issues we are debating today as dancing on the head of a pin. Presiding officer, it's not dancing on the head of a pin to insist that 20 years of stable devolution that has delivered good things for our fellow citizens be protected. Of course. Polly McNeill. Thank you for giving me. I was one of the 26, I think. As one of the 26 that you talked about in the first parliament, I wonder if you, if you would agree that Donald Dewar was the champion of devolution and prior to that, ensuring that the model, unlike the Welsh model, the Scottish model, was very much designed that it would be the, 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 those powers that were reserved was quite a deliberate act. And any attempt to change that is definitely undermining what we all and Donald Dewar chose to try and achieve in those days. 
Mike I would agree with that. Um, it is a, a good point, and the reserve model of, of devolution, which is not precisely the same as the Welsh model, is one that requires us to defend that and to consent when there are changes. And I shall come on to that point. Now, it's not dancing, as I said, on the head of a pin presiding office to insist that 20 years of stable de devolution that's delivered good things for our fellow citizens be protected, nor to demand the powers we use for the benefit of Scotland, which have been agreed by the people of Scotland. Now, on one view, the vulnerability of the principles of devolution to the UK government's approach to Brexit shouldn't surprise us. That government cannot answer even the most basic of questions on issues such as the customs union with just months to go before a withdrawal agreement must be signed. It has dismissed this parliament's views on wider Brexit issues, such as the single market and the triggering of Article 50. It's acted recklessly towards prosperity and peace in Northern Ireland. The reality of the last 23 months is that Theresa May seems concerned only about trying to keep together the warring factions of her party, regardless of the impact on jobs, living standards, or devolution. Presiding officer, in contrast to the division at Westminster, there has been consensus in this chamber over the need to protect the Scottish Parliament's powers. The Scottish Government has always acknowledged we must prepare our laws for withdrawal. In line with the clear majority of people in Scotland, we don't want to leave the EU but we accept that legal preparation for Brexit is required. And the UK government, for its part, recognise that it is required to get our consent to the, their EU withdrawal bill. And on that point, this parliament spoke very powerfully when it, in the interim report of the Finance and Constitution Committee in January, they agreed unanimously that the bill was incompatible with the devolution settlement in Scotland, and it could not therefore recommend consent. And clause 11 of the bill is, uh, not at this moment, please. I want to make some progress. Clause 11 was not an accidental clause. It encapsulates the current UK government's view of the type of devolution it wants to see operating only by the grace and favour of Downing Street. Now, to be fair, the UK government eventually responded to the unanimous view of this parliament and the Welsh Assembly and many others by making changes. But it is still clear in its newly reformulated Clause 11 how the UK government sees power being exercised on withdrawal from the EU. It's still clear how they view this parliament, and that view is unacceptable. For it would abandon the way in which we have all operated for almost two decades and break the devolution settlement we Adam have. Adam For giving way. Could the, would the minister explain why, contrary to his view, um, the view of the United Kingdom government is acceptable to the Labour government in Wales? Well, I think that probably is a question for the Labour government in Wales, but I would hazard a guess that one of the factors is that Scotland voted to remain in the EU and Wales voted to leave, something perhaps Tory members might want to reflect on. <laughs> the, the UK government wants to take a power to restrict the competence of this parliament. It wants to be able to exercise that power even in the face of an explicit decision that, from this parliament that it should not do so. This isn't about the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament or giving effect to the Sewell Convention. This is about the UK government, not the UK Parliament, for the first time being able to adjust the terms on which devolution operates through delegated legislation, and to be able to do so without the consent or actually against the wishes of this Parliament. There are existing and effective powers under the original Scotland Act which allow the competence of this Parliament or the Scottish Government to be adjusted. None of them operate in the way set out in the UK government's new Clause 11. Every single one of them requires changes to be passed by both the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament. Every single one of them requires proper democratic consent to be sought and received. Real consent, not presumed consent. A Section 30 order, for example, adjusting the list of reserve matters and therefore the boundaries of devolution, requires to be passed by this Parliament. It cannot become law without the consent of the Parliament and the country it affects. And there have been 30 orders passed under Section 30 since the par Parliament was established, all the product of agreement, all passed in this place and at Westminster. Even the Section 30 order for an independence referendum was able to secure support and win the consent of both Parliaments. Now, the UK government says it would not normally make these regulations without our consent. But those are not words that appear in the legislation. The legislation is actually drafted on the basis that proceeding with an order, even without consent from this parliament, even if this parliament has unanimously voted against it, will be normal. And it is that legislation to which we are being asked to consent. 
Moreover, the actual amendments to Clause 11, now passed by the House of Lords, say that the powers of this Parliament can be constrained for up to seven years, whether the Parliament agrees, whether it does not agree, or whether it makes no decision at all. The purpose... Just one moment. Sure, Stevenson. Um, is the Minister aware it may even, for fishing, be worse than that, in that the leaked white paper last week suggested that beyond the seven years, the powers over fishing would be retained at Westminster. That is bitterly disappointing to fishermen in my constituency across Scotland. Is that how the government feels too? Minister. It is indeed. And of course he is right. It is possible with uh, primary, legislation within, primary legislation within that period to permanently remove powers. The purpose of the constraint is apparently to enable discussion to take place on the establishment of common UK frameworks, but there's no need to impose an unprecedented, unequal and unacceptable new legislative constraint. We've already agreed there may be the need in certain areas to establish such frameworks. And in keeping with the spirit and principle of devolution, we agree those frameworks should be the product of negotiation and agreement between governments and parliaments. We agree that pending the establishment of common frameworks, both governments should maintain existing e-law, EU law regimes across the UK. Now, the Secretary of State for Scotland has said frameworks shouldn't be imposed. But as the Finance and Constitution Committee reported, this commitment that common frameworks will not be imposed is contradicted by the consent decision mechanism created by the UK government's amendments, which would allow the UK government to proceed with regulations without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. The committee made the key point that the devolution settlement can only function effectively if there is mutual trust between all of the UK's governments, if the substantial political agreement between governments is given effect by political means. The answer, presiding officer, therefore, is to proceed through reciprocal political commitments. That was the view of all parties on the committee except the Conservatives. And today in this motion, the Scottish Government is asking Parliament to withhold consent to the bill as it stands. Now, this won't be the end of the process. The offer of this Parliament is still on the table. However, passing this motion means that the EU withdrawal bill must be adjusted, either so it can command the consent of this Parliament or to reflect the terms of the legislative consent motion. And if the motion is passed today, that will be the will of this Parliament. What cannot happen, presiding officer, is what the UK government seems to want to happen. No, I'm sorry, I want to conclude. They want to ignore the reality of devolution. They want to drown out what this parliament says. But not even they can pretend that no motion has been passed. Nor can they pretend that this parliament is failing to face up to its responsibilities to enable the statute book for which it's responsible to be prepared. We are doing that, have done it through the continuity bill, and are doing it through this process today. There, the actions of the UK government, were they to impose legislation on this parliament, would be serious and unprecedented, and they would be noted here and across Europe. If there is a failure after today's vote to adapt the bill to devolution, it will be the UK that would be breaking trust and breaking the rules, not us. Presiding officer Donald Dewar began his famous speech in 1999 by looking at the mace that was in front of him then and is in front of us now. It has inscribed on it the first words of our founding statute, there shall be a Scottish Parliament. 20 years ago, they were words of aspiration, a statement of constitutional intent. Now, they are words of constitutional reality and of resolve. There is a Scottish Parliament and its voice must be heard. Donald Dewar cautioned us in his speech that the Scottish Parliament was not an end, it was a means to greater ends. And today we are called on for the first time to protect those means by refusing to accept changes to them to which we have not agreed. To protect those means so that we can go on achieving the best ends for Scotland we can. To protect those means because the people of Scotland themselves chose them and they chose us to protect them. And accordingly, presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Can I call Bruce Crawford on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee? Uh, thank you, President Officer. I speak in this debate in my capacity as the Convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee. I think it's fair to say that this debate marks the end of a long journey for the Committee since, introduction, since the introduction into the House of Lords of the EU Withdrawal Bill last July. 
This debate may mark the end of the LCM process in the Scottish Parliament, yet it marks only the, only the end of the beginning of the legislative process that any Brexit outcome will presage. The committee set out in January its initial position. Oh, it could definitely be some progress, please. Um, Richard, sorry. It said this um, brings us to the end of the legislative consent uh, process. Um, Spice have confirmed to us that actually there may be a legisl legislative consent motion may have to come after this. Is he aware of that? It, 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 it's always possible that the, the House of Commons may adjust the, the bill and the, the, the Parliament here would need to consider its response to that. That's always, but I'm just going on the situation as it is and stands just now. Now, the committee set it out in January, as I said, its initial position on the bill in our interim report following the completion of the passage of the bill through the House of Commons. Since then, we've continued to take evidence on the bill as it's evolved in the House of Lords. Our final report on the bill considers the changes that have been made to the bill on the context of whether the recommendations set out in our interim report have been addressed. Now, whilst the committee's position on our interim report was unanimous, it has unfortunately not been possible to achieve the same outcome in our final report. Conservative members of the committee have dissented from some of the committee's conclusions. However, I wish to thank all of my fellow committee members for the positive and collaborative way in which they have approached all aspects of the scrutiny of the bill, including our final report. I also wish to thank the committee's advisor on constitutional issues, Christine O'Neill, for the expert advice she provided to the committee throughout the scrutiny process, and so too to the clerks who, as usual, went through their job in an assiduous way. Mr. Officer, the committee recognises that there are parts of the bill where changes have been made that address some of the concerns which the committee raised in its interim report. Let me briefly mention a couple of these. The committee welcomes the amendment that has been made to afford the same protection to the Scotland Act of 1998 as was previously afforded to the bill, in the bill to the Northern Ireland Act. The com committee welcomes too the non-governmental amendments that have been made, such as those agreed in the House of Lords, to keep the Charter of Fundamental Rights as part of retained EU law. Similarly, the committee welcomes the progress that the governments have made in identifying areas which may be subject to common frameworks. Nevertheless, the committee continues to have significant concerns regarding the bill. It recognises that despite some progress, there remain fundamental differences between the Scottish Government and UK Government relating principally to Clause 11 and Schedule 3, the process for agreeing common frameworks and the powers of UK Ministers in devolved areas. Mr. Officer, the Committee does not come to a conclusion on consent either for or against on any part of the Bill except for Clause 11 and Schedule 3. On Clause 11, it is worth reiterating the Committee's unanimous conclusion in our interim report, where we stated Clause 11 represents a fundamental shift in the structure of devolution in Scotland. Since then, the UK Government have replaced original Clause 11 with the new Clause 15, which places a different restriction on the legislative competence of this Parliament. The new Clause 15 would not allow the Scottish Parliament to modify law in an area of e retained EU law where the modification is of a kind the UK Government has specified in regulations. Such UK regulations would be subject to a mechanism where whereby consent of the Scottish Parliament would be sought. However, even when consent is made by the Scottish Parliament to refuse consent, this would not prevent the UK Parliament from approving the relevant regulations. Officer, I would suggest that such an approach would not normally meet a common understanding of consent. As Abe Blinken observed, no man is good enough to govern another man without the other's consent. In addition to the new Clause 15, the UK Government has produced a proposed intergovernmental agreement and memorandum of understanding, both of which are intended to provide non-statutory commitments on behalf of the UK Government. The proposed agreement states that the UK Government commits to making regulations through a collaborative process and that the UK Government will not normally be asked to approve Clause 15 regulations without the consent of the devolved legislators. The UK Government has also made a non-statutory commitment not to bring forward legislation 
to modif modify EU law applying in England in areas covered by the Clause 15 regulations. From the Committee's perspective, it is not clear why the UK Government should be subject to a voluntary constraints, while the devolved governments are subject to statutory constraints. President Officer, the approach of the UK Government suggests that it does not trust the devolved governments. The Committee's view is that the devolved settlement cannot function effectively without mutual trust between all of the governments across the United Kingdom. Accordingly, the Committee proposes that the constraints that would be placed on Scottish Government should be the same, on the same basis as constraints placed on the UK Government. In other words, the two governments should agree to commit to a non-legislative political constraint not to bring forward legislation in areas where common frameworks are likely to be needed. The committee also notes that such an approach remains the preferred outcome of the Welsh Government. President officer, such an approach would genuinely represent a partnership of equals. The new Clause 15 is also intended to provide a mechanism to allow for the creation of common UK frameworks. However, the non-statutory approach the committee recommends would mean that Clause 15 would not be necessary to enable the agreement of common frameworks. President officer, it's worth reiterating the committee's position in their interim report on common frameworks, which was to welcome the commitment of the UK government that common frameworks will not be imposed. The committee strongly believes that both the process for agreeing common frameworks and the actual content must, not, must be arrived at through agreement and not imposed. That remains the position of the committee. However, the committee considers the commitment made by the Secretary of State for Scotland that common frameworks will not be imposed is contradicted by the consent decision mechanism created by the UK Government's new Clause 15. So, I think it's fair to say that ling just linguistic gymnastics would be required in the Bill to define a consent decision would have provided Nadia Comaneci with a perfect 10. <laughs> Clause 15 would allow the UK Government to proceed with regulations without the consent of the Scottish Government. The Committee's view is that a solution to this impasse should rest on reciprocal political commitments being made by both governments. This will allow the discussions on common frameworks to proceed and provide the clarity and certainty needed. Lastly, President Officer, I wish to briefly comment on the powers proposed in the Bill for UK Ministers to legislate in devolved areas without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. In our interim report, we stated that we, deeply, we were deeply concerned about the lack of any statutory provision within the Bill for UK Ministers to seek the consent of Scottish Ministers or the Scottish Parliament to legislate in devolved areas. This concern is accentuated by the fact that the Sewell Convention does not apply to subordinate legislation. The Committee is deeply concerned, therefore, that these provisions of the Bill, which we consider cut across the devolution settlement. President Officer, in conclusion, the, the Committee, believe, I, I believe, has tried hard to fulfil a constructive role throughout our scrutiny of the Withdrawal Bill. This approach has, con has continued in our final report, where we have sought to offer a positive solution to the current impasse. We consider that the current situation can be resolved through an emphasis on mutual trust and respect. Currently, that is sadly lacking. The committee recommends the inclusion of a reciprocal political commitments in the proposed intergovernmental agreement as a means that would emphasize mutual respect and enable progress to be made. Such an approach would represent a genuine commitment to a partnership of equals between the constituent parts of the United Kingdom. Now, we do not discount the possibility that the two governments may yet be able to reach agreement on alternative ways to be break the current impasse. But that is our proposed solution. Regardless, without the solution, and given the fundamental differences that exist between the UK and Scottish governments, the committee recommends that the P Scottish Parliament does not consent to Clause 15 and Schedule 3 of the Bill. President Officer. Thank you. Can I call Adam Tompkins to open for the Conservative Party? Thank you, Presiding Officer. We have debated the EU withdrawal bill numerous times in this chamber, and members will recall that throughout, the Scottish Conservatives have joined parties across the Parliament in arguing that Clause 11 of the bill, as introduced, was not fit for purpose and needed to be replaced. 
It was not fit for purpose because, as the Minister and Pauline McNeill said earlier on this afternoon, it turned one of the pillars of devolution upside down. All powers not expressly reserved to Westminster are devolved in Scotland to us. This was the principle that the original Clause 11 failed to respect, and this was our reason for arguing that it needed radical change. That change has now been delivered by a UK Government amendment agreed without division at report stage in the House of Lords. The new Clause 11, now, for, now Clause 15 of the Bill as amended, ensures that all powers repatriated from the European Union following Brexit, which fall within devolved competence, will come here unless they are expressly held in reserve. And this is exactly as it should be. This is the fundamental change to the original Clause 11 that we called for, that the Scottish Government called for, and that the Finance Committee of this Parliament unanimously called for. And peers right across the House of Lords have recognised this, as has the Labour government in Wales. This is what Mark Drakeford, the key minister in the Welsh government, said about the amended Clause 11. This is a deal we can work with, which has required compromise on both sides. Our aim throughout, he said, has been to protect devolution. Comparing the original Clause 11 with its amended version, Mark Drakeford said this, London has changed its position so that all powers and policy areas rest with the devolved administrations unless specified to be temporarily held by the UK government. And these will be areas where we all agree common UK-wide rules are needed for a functioning UK internal market." Unquote. In the House of Lords. Yes. Bruce Crawford. Um, I thank Adam Tompkins. I accept the points made by Adam Drakeford and the points you just made, Adam Tompkins. Would you also accept, though, in the letter he sent in April, the, 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 the same Mr Drakeford suggested that the preferred option of the, U, the Welsh Government was actually the option laid out by the Finance Committee. I'm the, the, the fact is that the Welsh Government have compromised, the United Kingdom Government have compromised, and the only Government that hasn't compromised is the Scottish Government. And that's the reality. In the House of Lords, both Labour and Liberal Democrat peers spoke strongly in support of the amended Clause 11. This is really quite a good deal, Lord Steele said. This is a considerable advance with much better arrangements, Lord Wallace of Tankiness said. These experienced, measured and senior politicians are among the founding fathers of devolution. And if this deal is good enough for them, it should be good enough for us too, and we should give it our consent today. This disagreement, this disagreement on Clause 11 has more than once been characterised as dancing on the head of a pin. Some have unkindly described it, as the dullest constitutional crisis in history. Mike Russell compared it last week with the Schleswig-Holstein problem, and only three people understood the Schleswig-Holstein problem, and one of them went mad, so the minister had better be careful. But if we strip the current disagreement back to first principles, if we, if we strip the current disagreement back to first principles, we can perhaps more easily see what the argument is about. There are two principles at the root of this matter. First, Brexit must be delivered compatibly with our devolution settlement. Leaving the European Union in no sense means we can somehow return to the Constitution of 1972. And secondly, Brexit must not be allowed to undermine the integrity of the United Kingdom, and in particular, the integrity of the UK's internal market. This isn't just in the UK's interests, it's in Scotland's interests. Scotland, remember, trades four times as much with the rest of the United Kingdom as it does with the whole of the European Union. Brexit absolutely cannot be allowed to result in the creation of new trade barriers between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Now, these two principles are not unionist principles. They are principles on which both unionists and nationalists can and do agree. And neither are they conservative principles. They are matters which unite us all left and right alike. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, I could not have supported a withdrawal bill, or for that matter, a continuity bill, which failed to respect either of these principles. Yeah. I did not support the original Clause 11 because it fell foul of the first principle. That, not, not at the moment, Mr. Rumbles. It, because it fell foul of the first principle, that Brexit must be delivered compatibly with devolution. And I did not, and still do not, support the SNP's continuity bill because it falls foul both of this principle and of the principle that the integrity of the UK's internal market must be safeguarded. But the amended Clause 11, or Clause 15, as the bill stands today, does adhere to both of these fundamental principles. And that's what Mark Drakeford, David Steele, and Jim Wallace, among many others, have all said. This is the reason why we on these benches think that this Parliament should now give its consent to the European Union withdrawal bill. Happy to give way to Mr Rumbles now. Mike Rumbles. 
Tompkins for giving way, and he referred to my colleagues in the House of Lords, but I want to make sure that this is clear. I and my Liberal Democrat colleagues here will support the Scottish Government's motion because we don't want anyone to construe that we would give our consent to the UK Government's bill to leave the European Union in the first place. Adam Tompkins. Well, we, well it, the, 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 the cat has been let out of the bag, hasn't it? The Liberal Democrats' position here has got nothing to do with ensuring that Brexit is delivered compatibly with devolution and everything to do with trying to reverse Brexit yes, itself. Well Presiding officer, set in the context of these fundamental constitutional principles, let us delve a little into the detail of the amended uh, Clause 11. I said a few moments ago that the first thing that it does is to ensure that all powers falling within devolved competence that are repatriated from the European Union after Brexit come here to this Parliament. There is no Westminster power grab. The powers come here. This Parliament will become significantly more powerful as a direct result of Brexit. We will have new powers over energy, including renewable energy, over aviation, over noise pollution, over the marine environment, over forestry and land use, environmental impact, carbon capture, water quality, and a whole range of further powers in addition. The only exception, presiding officer, is where regulations are made temporarily to hold a power in reserve to ensure that that power does not inadvertently undermine or jeopardise the integrity of the UK and its internal market. These powers, all parties, including the SNP, agree, should be exercised in accordance with UK-wide common frameworks. But it's not just the existence of UK-wide common frameworks that all parties and all governments have agreed to, it's the subject matters, the policy areas where those common frameworks will be needed that all parties, again including the SNP, have agreed to. So, the amended Clause 11 will hold in reserve only powers that the SNP has already agreed should be exercised subject to a UK-wide common framework. And these powers, presiding officer, are all powers, each and every one of them, that we in this parliament cannot currently exercise. Not a single power is being taken away from us as a result of the withdrawal bill. We cannot exercise these powers at the moment because they're not held here. They're held in Brussels. And that, of course, is where the SNP Green Alliance would prefer they remain. Yeah. Yeah. So this whole argument, this whole argument is about powers which the SNP has already agreed should be exercised subject to a UK-wide common framework and which are currently exercised by Brussels. And for, the, for these reasons, presiding officer, it is frankly baffling that we are where we are today. We should long since have moved on. There is serious work ahead and we should be getting on with it. We should be negotiating and agreeing common frameworks. We should be preparing our statute book for exit day and beyond. We should be turning our minds to how we want to exercise the new powers that are coming to us. We should be thinking about what sort of regime of agricultural subsidy or fishing support we want in Scotland. How do we keep food prices low but ensure at the same time that farmers and crofters are properly supported? How do we want to tailor and adapt European standards of environmental protection so that they match Scotland's needs and priorities more accurately? In short, how do we rise to the challenges that Brexit undoubtedly presents and at the same time take advantage of the new opportunities that it affords us? In policy areas, we've not been able to develop for ourselves for more than 45 years. These are big questions, much bigger than the constitutional dancing on pinheads to which we are being treated again today. Presiding officer, it is time to move on and address these questions. Let's give our consent today to the withdrawal bill and get on with the job at hand. I move the amendment in my name. Well Thank you very much. I call Neil Findlay to open for the Labour Party. Hey, thanks, presiding officer. And in case I forget, can I move the amendment in my name? And could I offer a bit of friendly advice to Mr uh, Tompkins, maybe in Mental Health Awareness Week? He has to get a more sensitive gag writer. I would think. Design officer, if, uh, if there is one reason, uh, one lesson from all of this debate over the last year, it's no matter the reason, no matter the country, no matter how simplistically people try to present it, extricating any state or part of a state from a political and economic union that has, that has been a member of for even just 40 years is a very complex torturous, time-consuming and difficult thing to do. If we look at the negotiations around Clause 11, now 15 alone, we can see the extraordinary amount of time and effort, and when it comes down to it, money, that has been spent. 
And very important though these negotiations are, I'm sure that all of us would rather have seen that amount of time and effort put in to ending child poverty, addressing the inadequacies in our mental health services, building homes for the people sleeping on the streets of our city and towns today, some just yards from this parliament. And I say that because this situation was there to be avoided. There was and is no need for the stalemate we have found ourselves in to have come about. All it needed was for the Tories and David Mundell, the Cabinet's least influential and most irrelevant member, to have, along with Ruth Davidson and Adam Tompkins, delivered the amendments to Clause 11 that they said they would. Nothing more, nothing less. But their failure to deliver is what has taken us to today's position. The blame lies largely in their court. President officer, the, sta the stakes are high, certainly. Lord of Fraser. Very grateful to Mr Finlay for giving way. On the 26th of April, Leslie Laird, as the Shadow Scottish Secretary, welcomed the deal between the Welsh Government and the UK Government and called on the Scottish Government to follow suit. Who speaks for the Scottish Labour Party these days? Is Mr Finlay and his colleagues or the Shadow Scottish Secretary, Leslie Laird? Neil Finlay. Leslie Laird, I moved amendments in the House of Commons that would have resolved this situation and your lot were whipped to vote against it. That's how we got to this situation, Mr Fraser. Mr Finlay, not your lot, please. The stakes are high. Workers across a range of sectors need a clear legislative and regular, regulatory framework to work to. Businesses, exporters, importers need to plan ahead. The NHS and public services all need certainty for long-term planning. Yet instead of certainty, all we have is confusion. From the initial 101 areas of dispute on creating common frameworks, I'm pleased to see that there has been progress and we're down to 24. Then again, maybe not 24, because according to Mr Mundell, that number may increase again. That's not certainty, that's more uncertainty. And these are in areas that ordinarily would be devolved to this parliament under the reserve powers model of our devolved settlement. We cannot and will not support these powers being repatri repatriated to anywhere other than this parliament first, then consent sought to create those common frameworks and regulations. This is absolutely consistent with the Scottish Labour Party's long held commitment and support for devolution. Labour was central to establishing the constitutional convention that let's not forget the Tories and the SNP boycotted. Labour representatives, some in this parliament did the heavy lifting, working across parties with the Liberals, the Greens and civic society, at times having to compromise, but in the end agreeing a workable model for Scotland's Parliament. And since then, despite the many huge ups and downs of that process and under intense pressure at times, we have stood resolute in defence of the devolution settlement and the constitutional change that people voted for in such big numbers in 1997. We've defended devolution at every turn, from every attack, from wherever it has come, and now we seek to strengthen it as we take post-Brexit powers over areas critical to the development of the fair, just, progressive society that we want to create. Areas such as public procurement, where we want to use the powers of this parliament to, to deliver a public procurement agenda that ends discrimination, ends blacklist and addresses zero hours contracts, promotes sustainability and delivers fair pay and jobs. Taking these powers and crucially using them is not some theoretical exercise for Mr Tompkins' constitutional law students. It is crucial if we're to deliver the democratic socialist society that we want to see and he used to. President officer, in the Commons, Labour sought to improve this bill, but the Tories voted down our amendments. And the Lords, Labour Lords voted for amendments to make a bad bill better. A bill the Tories themselves described as not fit for purpose. The Welsh Government, with a different devolution history and legal system, have worked to negotiate a system that they believe will work for them. That is their right and it indeed evidence of devolution at work. But they have made it clear that they will continue to work with Scottish Labour and the Scottish Government to try and improve on the deal that they have struck. At the weekend, uh, Richard Leonard, in good faith, reached out to all parties seeking talks to end the impasse. Parties in this parliament have worked together before. On this very important matter, I believe and we believe they can do so again. And I'm pleased that the minister has indicated that he is supportive of that approach. 
We're serious about trying to find a solution to this situation. I hope that UK ministers are too. And just as I was getting to my feet, we had an indication from David Liddington that appears, he, he appears to be open to those discussions. Let me say to the Chamber, we're up for it. It appears Mr Russell's up for it. Let's encourage the Tories to get David Liddington on board and let's get round the table and start negotiating. Thank you. I now call on Patrick Harvey to open for the Green Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, echo the thanks to my fellow committee members and everybody who's contributed uh, to the committee's work on this issue? And can I begin by welcoming the unity that appears to be being shown tonight. It appears that tonight Green, Labour, SNP and Liberal Democrat MSPs will stand together in defence of the Parliament that we campaigned for together 20 years ago. The Conservatives, the party which campaigned against the creation of this place, had given the general impression over those 20 years that they had accepted how wrong they were and had come to accept the existence of this parliament. Well, what has become glaringly obvious since this Brexit crisis began is that they still cannot come to accept the legitimacy of the distinct political will that exists in Scotland. It has been expressed in elections to this parliament and it has been expressed in the 62% remain vote two years ago and the Conservatives are ignoring both. Look, I think everybody knows that I'm not someone who sees much merit in the Conservative Party's politics, which I consider broadly despicable. But I can still admit, I can still admit that I had thought, I had thought there were some Tory politicians who were basically rational and decent people. People I could respect despite promoting a political ideology that I detest. What I've been astonished at what I've been astonished at is the speed at which they have abandoned reason and thrown their lot in with the Brexit extremists. In doing so, they are ignoring not only the views of the people they represent on the question of Europe itself, but they are also ignoring every objective assessment of the country's best interests in favour of the delusional ramblings of their party's extremist fringe and those further right whose support they seek to win back. But as well as this, as well as this, the other aspect of Scotland's political will that the Tory position today is ignoring is the desire to have a parliament here in Scotland which makes decisions on the same basis that was set out those 20 years ago, a model which has developed over that time, but which has never moved away from the principle that what is not reserved is devolved. And let's remember that the most recent development of devolution involved a commitment eagerly welcomed by Adam Tompkins and his colleagues to give the principle of legislative consent a statutory basis. Well, we were sceptical of that promise, presiding officer. We were unconvinced that that promise had any real substance in law. But even I didn't imagine that just months after passing the most recent Scotland Act, they would tear the whole idea up, utterly overturning the principle of consent. I understand that our education committee has been looking at the issue of consent education for young people. All well and good, an important issue which does need to be addressed. But the person most clearly in need of consent education is the Secretary of State for Scotland. Consent, if the idea is to be meaningful at all, Consent must be freely given or withheld, without any coercion, without any threat. It must be freely revocable, something that can be withdrawn at any time. And most importantly, most fundamentally, the idea of consent must be respected. And if the UK government proceeds with its apparent threat to legislate in this area without our consent, then they will have entirely justified us in rejecting this bill, proving that they cannot be trusted on the principle of legislative consent. Presiding officer, I want to turn to the, the Labour amendment. I, I can't honestly say that I see a great deal of value in it. There have been cross-party talks here at Holyrood 
organised by the Scottish Government, which Neil Finlay and I have both participated in, and I'm not aware of any innovative new proposals from Labour so far. I'm still in that position after hearing Mr Finlay's speech. Would another series, would another series of such meetings involving UK ministers actually force them to relent? Would it actually change their position? I doubt it. I give way to Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. Yes, we have had um, uh, cross-party discussions here with the Scottish Government. We've never had cross-party discussions when the UK Government have been at the table uh, as well. And wouldn't it be good for us to show a united front and putting yeah. forward some ideas exactly. to break this logjam? Surely Mr Harvey would want that. Patrick Harvey. of more meetings and if Mr Finlay wants there to be more meetings I'll, I'll come along but I am entirely sceptical that the UK government will relent, will change their position and that is what needs to be changed. I see no evidence that they are about to do so. It seems to me that this is more like the magical thinking of those on the Labour front bench at Westminster who have also given up on the country's best interests and seem positively supportive of abandoning our European future they are rightly scathing. They are rightly scathing about a UK government that can't even make its mind up about customs arrangements nearly two years after their self-induced Brexit crisis began. But the Labour leadership seem only able to offer the idea that if they were at the negotiating table, the inherent problems and contradictions of Brexit would somehow evaporate and they would simply get a better deal. This is magical thinking. And today's amendment seems little different. But whatever. If they want to cling to the idea that one more round of meetings will somehow persuade Mandel, Leddington and co to relent and abandon their position, then fine. The critical point, presiding officer, the critical point is that we must all, everyone who believes in the legitimacy of this parliament and the distinct political will of the people we represent, stand together in defence against this EU withdrawal bill. Those who worked together to create this place must now unite to stop the demolition squad led by Ruth Davison and Theresa May. And if we can unite in that in the final vote tonight, we will be doing our jobs. Thank you. And I call on Tavish Scott to open for the Liberal Democrats. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I let um, Mr. Tompkins into a rather badly kept secret? The Liberal Democrats are actually in favour of staying in the European yeah, yeah. Uh, Union. Uh, he probably was at uh, one time uh, too, and we're not going to change our view on that one iota, no matter how much shouting there is from my right. Uh, can I also say another thing to him, that he talked about the powers of this, pa of this place built up over many years. Uh, Jim Wallace and David Steele, amongst many others, uh, were uh, all about that. They're also Europeans to their fingertips. But here's the difference between Jim Wallace and David Steele and the Tories. Uh, they were in favour of devolution, not against it all those years ago. We don't need any lectures from the Tories on who was for devolution and who was against it. Uh, it is, uh, as Bruce Crawford, I think, ac accurately described, disappointing that the governments have not yet reached agreement. Uh, much more must happen between our governments, uh, and that has to happen with some urgency. And we should be clear, the Welsh Government have said that further change is necessary, as have the peers in the House uh, of Lords. But the UK must learn the internal lessons from this ongoing uh, farce. We have consistently argued that the UK needs a strong dispute resolution mechanism that would underpin a mature partnership between the different parts uh, of the UK. That is something that the UK and Scottish governments should have already agreed, but we seem as far away as ever. Liberal Democrat MSPs do not believe on balance that the Scottish Parliament should give consent. There has been uh, some movement, as has already been reflected in this debate, on the clauses uh, that have been discussed, but not enough. So we want the, U the Scottish and UK governments to continue to work for an agreement. People deserve uh, much, much more, much, much more than Trump-style diplomacy from London. Two years after the UK voted to leave the EU and just nine months before the formal departure, everything has happened, but nothing has happened. Today's debate is secondary, very secondary, to the turmoil within the UK government. If a UK cabinet cannot reach an agreement on its negotiating position over the future relationship with the EU, is it any surprise that they have not reached agreement with the devolved nations within the United Kingdom? Brexit and the loss of the single market is bad for the UK and bad for Scotland. Our country will be poorer, our workforce weaker, our future prospects less secure. My colleagues will not support that. 
We will not be handing power to the Brexiteers, to the right wing of the Conservative Party, to a Prime Minister who may be in office but certainly is not in power. We will make the case for the people to have their say on what the final Brexit offer is, even if others will not. Last week demonstrated the real nature of the internal Tory negotiations. They cannot even agree amongst themselves. Last night, Tory backbenchers trooped into Downing Street, and the worst Prime Minister in living memory seems to have said, don't blame me. She has set up not one but two competing cabinet committees on her customs union dilemma. Johnson and Gove have branded her position crazy, but calling the Prime Minister crazy does not constitute a sacking offence in the modern Conservative Party. It is merely a contribution to the debate. A war cabinet used to face the enemy. A Conservative war cabinet now faces each other. Battle after battle, not against the EU, but blue on blue. Hammond versus Johnson, Gold versus Clark, Mundell versus... No, that's not fair. I can't imagine <laughs> David being against anyone. This government, surely the worst now in living memory, will not uh, uh, achieve an agreed position before the June EU summit. The chance of any substantial package before October is absolutely nil. Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are an irrelevance to London, not because the Tories have given up on being unionists, no of course not, but because a fight to the death over Europe trumps everything else. Presiding officer, no presiding officer, no uh, Prime Minister, and by which I mean a competent one with a vision for Britain's future, and that is not Theresa May, could square Ken Clark, Nicky Morgan and Anna Soubry with Rhys Morgan and his right-wing hardline over-the-cliff Brexiteers, and yet she is still the occupant of number 10. I'll happily give way on Rhys Morgan. Yes, Oliver. Yeah. Oliver Mundell. I'm, I'm struggling, presiding officer, to see how the member's view squares with that of his Liberal Democrat colleagues in the House of Lords. It just sounds like a completely different argument that's been put forward here in Scotland whilst they're down in the House of Lords saying this is a good deal. Tavis Scott. I do. Uh, so the amendments in the House of Lords on the single market, Mr Mundell, on the uh, customs union, Mr Mundell, and on the freedom charter of freedom rights, fundamentally important to our future, what Liberal Democrats believe in, that's what they did in the House, in the House of Lords. And the question for the Conservatives, the questions uh, for this Conservative group in this Parliament and for the Tories down in London, the Scottish Tory MPs who all claim to speak for Scotland is, will they back those Lords Amendment or will they not? We're about to find that out. Uh, so what uh, the UK needs now uh, is opposition. I agree with Richard Leonard's approach uh, uh, on a cross-party look at the Scottish position involving the UK government, and that seemed to me the point uh, he and Neil Finlay were making and that Patrick Harvey uh, rather missed. But Richard Leonard also needs to carry that weight in London. And frankly, Labour should be 20 points ahead of the Tories in the opinion polls, but sadly it doesn't appear that Jeremy Corbyn is a great fan of the EU, nor of the single uh, market. So if Jeremy Corbyn saves a Tory Prime Minister in the coming House of Commons votes on Europe, he will have sold out the very young people in our country who he claims are his bedrock support. That should not, should not happen. So what of these Tory MPs and MSPs? Most used to back the EU single market and customs union. There are plenty of quotes illustrating all that, but they do not now. The hard Brexit line about mythical trade deals across the world is the new, is the new Nirvana presiding officer. And that cannot be, that cannot be. The big question for these Tories is, do they support the EU withdrawal bill as it has been amended on the Lords, on the single market, on the customs union, on the Charter of Fundamental Rights? And that we are about to find out. That is the, uh, that is the situation that confronts this country uh, now. This is not a constitutional crisis. In July, the Supreme Court will determine which of the two governments legislation can stand. They are working under our devolution laws uh, and the Constitution. They will do that and they will give certainty that should have given by politicians, but wasn't. But we are where we are on the EU and on Brexit and on the devolved powers of the devolved nations, which is frankly going round in circles. A Tory government obsessed by itself, not people living across the nations of the UK. No wonder people are fed up with them. Thank you. We move into the open debate. And before I'm going to call Ash Denham, followed by Maurice Golden. Before we start, just to say to members, there uh, is plenty of time for interventions. I would also encourage members, where possible, uh, to use members' full names, even members of Parliament in Westminster. Please use their full names as a bit more respectful. I call Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In international relations, there is something known as the rational actor theory, that states will always act in their own best interests. And it can be sometimes used to predict how they will act in certain situations. International relations and politics is often about predicting behaviour, detecting red line issues 
in order to move towards agreement so that a solution can be reached where both sides feel they've got what they needed. It might be a round of trade negotiations where the position of each side that's far apart in the beginning slowly inches closer and closer until the distance between them is not so great anymore. It may involve crafting a convoluted form of words so the real meaning is diluted enough to be palatable enough to satisfy. The latest proposals from the UK government, which I'm sure were very painstakingly drafted and then redrafted, on first glance looked so much more like something the Scottish Parliament could sign up to. But when examined closely, the promise that they held disintegrated like a dried rose handled carelessly, sad tiny fragments that won't go back together. And that's the problem that we have here. A state with extremely asymmetric power relations between the devolved governments and the UK government facing a huge challenge in the shape of Brexit. And instead of harnessing the power of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government to put all hands to the pump, to make lighter work of it across these islands, the UK Government instead seems intent on breaking the pump so that it doesn't work for anyone. Rational actors that they are, the Scottish Government is acting in its own and also in this Parliament's best interests. And the UK government, one has to assume, thinks it's acting in what its own best interests are. Consequently, we are now at an impasse. The current proposals that have been put forward by the UK government, although not of the blanket nature they were previously, still retain the power to restrict the Scottish Parliament's legislative competence. Then, in my view, now ludicrously, incorporate a mechanism by which the consent of the Scottish Parliament is sought to any regulations proposed to be changed by the UK Government. However, regulations can be made by the UK Government once this Parliament has made a consent decision, even if that is a decision refusing consent. Instead of respecting the devolution settlement, we are now in a position where the UK has seemingly gone out of its way to mock the very idea of consent. Out in the real world, if you ask someone what they think of an explicit refusal being taken as a consent decision, it becomes very clear very quickly just how far down the rabbit hole the UK government have now taken us. There will be a legislative constraint on the Scottish Government, but there is only a voluntary one on the UK Government. The proposals would uniquely, and for the first time ever, give UK Ministers the right to use secondary legislation to alter the devolved competencies of the Scottish Parliament. The UK Government wants the Scottish Government and this Parliament to trust them. And yet, in this process, as the player with the greater power, they have the perfect opportunity here to show trust, to demonstrate goodwill, to recreate or to reset intergovernmental relations, and to put devolution on a firm footing at this very important time. And yet, they haven't. They're asking for us to trust them, but throughout, they failed to show that they are worthy of this Parliament's trust. Indeed, it was not clear to the committee why the UK government should be subject to only voluntary constraints, while the devolved governments should be subject to statutory constraints. And further, that the devolved settlement cannot function effectively without mutual trust between all the governments across the UK. Consequently, the committee view is that what is now called Clause 11, formally sorry, Clause 15, formerly Clause 11, should be removed from the bill, and that a solution to the impasse would instead be reciprocal political commitments. And that would be where both governments sign up to respect and to trust each other. The fragments of trust that remain could, if that approach was taken, be rebuilt. As it stands, only one government is acting rationally. 
listening to the voice of this Parliament and removing Clause 11 is in the UK's best interests. And I sincerely hope that they recognise that this evening. The UK government should show the leadership now that is required. And to present this as a continuum, as the Conservatives have today, with a government at each end, where if both governments just compromise a little bit more, all will be well, is a fundamentally flawed analysis. This is not a trade negotiation. We cannot compromise over the founding principle of devolution. You either have a proposal which respects it or one that does not. The committee's view is that Clause 11 does not respect it and therefore, as a committee, we recommend that this parliament does not consent. Thank you. I call Morris Golden, who followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Golden, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, let me put on record my complete support for the establishment of this Parliament, even though I was not old enough to vote for it, let alone able to be a representative in the first session, as Mike Russell reflected upon in his opening remarks. But both I and my Scottish Conservative colleagues respect and back to the hilt the devolution settlement. Of course, as we prepare to leave the EU, there is a need to make sure that we are ready for the post-Brexit world. That is exactly what the UK government is doing through the EU withdrawal bill, seeking to ensure the United Kingdom continues to run smoothly. The initial plan was for all returning powers to be managed by the UK government until the establishment of long-term frameworks. Quite rightly, this parliament stood united. We all considered the plan to be unnecessary in its scope and inconsistent with the devolution settlement. However, the UK government has proven itself to be acting in good faith, making major concessions and reducing the number of temporarily retained powers to 24 in total. Here we go. Uh, Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, Who have we got? That's not very courteous. Mr Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. He, he asks us to believe that the UK government is acting in good faith. And I suspect that's a big part of this disagreement. His party trusts them. A lot of us don't. Does he not understand that if the UK government proceeds and legislates anyway without this parliament's consent, they will have pr proven our side of that argument right and his side wrong? Morris Golden. Uh, sorry, presiding officer, I should have said, so who do we have? That would be more grammatically correct, I believe. <laughs> but uh, uh, certainly, I believe that the solution to all of this is to negotiate, get round the table, do the best deal which will work for Scotland and the United Kingdom. Now, one thing that is crystal clear is that we must have consistent regulations that apply across the United Kingdom whilst long-term solutions are agreed. So, for example, ensuring we maintain a consistent food labelling regime rather than diverge into multiple systems. This would hurt consumers and businesses alike. The rest of the powers returning from Brussels will come straight to this Parliament. This is a clear sign of the UK government's commitment to devolution, a commitment that has already seen significant new powers over taxation and welfare devolved from Westminster to Scotland. The UK government's approach to the returning powers is both reasonable and respectful of devolution. This is evidenced by the fact that the Welsh government, who were originally opposed to previous proposals, have now endorsed it. Mark Drakeford, the Welsh Finance Secretary, was very clear on this point, saying that the Welsh aim has been to protect devolution and that this has been achieved. Of course, this is a temporary measure. The powers would reside with the UK Parliament for no longer than two years and the regulations coming from them would last a maximum of five. The irony of the SNP crying foul over this five-year period is that it will have taken them longer to take responsibility for the already devolved welfare powers. The SNP should be focused 
on the real issue, securing the long-term frameworks needed to give business certainty, safeguard jobs and keep our economy running. To do that, we need to have common UK-wide frameworks on certain policy areas. It is a point the UK government and the SNP readily agree on. Mike Russell said as much last year when he accepted that some common frameworks are needed. He is absolutely right and on this because the UK market underpins much of Scotland's prosperity, accounting for over £45 billion in trade, almost four times as much as with the EU and counting for half a million Scottish jobs. The UK and Welsh governments have shown themselves willing to negotiate and agree a deal. Unfortunately, the SNP have shown that they are not yet ready to fully move past the stage of political posturing. In March, we were told the sticking point in negotiation was down to one word, agree. If only the UK government would amend the bill to say the Scottish Parliament would agree to frameworks and how they governed a deal could be done, the SNP said. Simple as that, Mike Russell declared. Well, the agreement on the Clause 11 amendments does now contain the word agree, but the SNP still won't accept it. We were told that a lack of a sunset clause was the reason holding up negotiations. The UK government has included one, but still no sign of an agreement from the SNP. Time and again, the UK government has engaged, given ground and tried to reach a deal. Time and again, the SNP have moved the goalposts. Even at this late hour, it is not too late for the SNP to put party politics aside, get back to the negotiating table and strike the deal that Scotland needs. The Scottish Conservatives stand ready to offer whatever assistance we can to help them to do that if the SNP are willing. Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Neil Bibby. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, presenting officer. Uh, the, the, first, the First Minister of this Parliament uh, stated, there shall be a Scottish Parliament. And he followed that on by saying, I like that. Now, I often wonder that if the Scotland Act uh, were to be drawn up today by a Conservative uh, Secretary of State, whether they would actually be able to say the same. Our second First Minister, Henry McLeish, was quoted in the, at the weekend as saying that Tory ministers will use a power grab to trample over Scotland and strike trade deals with Donald Trump. Now, this is the same President Donald Trump that Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson was cooing over last weekend in trying to encourage the UK to ditch, in his words, the lunar pool of Brussels. It's also the same Boris Johnson who describes one of his trade options by uh, his UK government that's under, that's under consideration as crazy. Uh, also, you can see why the, the UK Parliament uh, would rather then ha actually have the powers over uh, areas such as fishing, farming and the environment, to name just some of the devolved areas, to make new deals with others, including uh, President Trump, and raising the ugly prospect of TTIP on a global scale. Also, you can also see why Dr Kirsty Hughes and Dr Katie Hayward, the eminent scholars in their fields, said that devolution has been seen uh, more as uh, an oration uh, than as a central concern in planning Brexit. Now, former Clause 11, now uh, 15, skews the power balance between Scotland and the UK parliaments to a degree which is just not acceptable. And this side of the chamber see it as a power grab, which undermines the Scotland Act, while the Secretary of State for Scotland sees it as preserving the current boundaries of devolved competence, i.e. know your place and don't reach for anything more. Now, we need to have a level playing field. We need the trust and open communication uh, the two institutions should have between them. And that can only be achieved if there is a balance of power between them. As a poor attempt at a compromise, the UK government has given a political commitment and that's important, and that phraseology is important, a political commitment that it will not normally use the Clause 15 regulations without the consent of the devolved parliaments. And quite frankly, that means nothing. This would be a voluntary commitment by the UK Parliament, and one that has been repeated so many times at committee that it has almost become the norm. The, the, clause, the new Clause 15 would be, a, uh, would be a statutory constraint on this Parliament while the commitment to wield that power wisely would only be a voluntary vow, especially if it was used for something that we disagreed with. And we all know how reliable vows actually are. The Secretary of State 
David Mundell it doesn't want, and I'll quote, an administration in one part of the UK to effectively have a veto on issues that affect the whole of the UK. Now, without a hint of irony, it doesn't see that that is exactly what the UK Parliament is doing to Scotland and Northern Ireland with Brexit. But what is also glaringly clear is that the UK Parliament is using this legislation in the same way that they might use a sledgehammer to put in a nail. Now, what is crucial here is that the Secretary of State for Scotland has repeatedly, repeatedly refused to rule out overruling a decision of this Parliament if it does indeed decide to withhold consent. Now, clearly, it didn't want to indulge in that hypothetical scenario. However, by 5 p.m. tonight, there will no longer be a hypothetical scenario. We will know exactly where this Parliament stands on the issue. The Secretary of State will then have to inform Scotland and also his government to, to tell us actually what they are going to do next. Now, presenting also, every member of this chamber will welcome the work that has taken place to improve the UK government's EU withdrawal bill. Every member wants that bill to be fixed so that this parliament can sign up to it and to work in the best interests of our constituents over the next coming years. And with the huge level of uncertainty and anxiety being caused by Brexit. However, the fact that the Conservatives in this parliament stand alone and their position is telling. They have a government in London to adhere to instead of constituents to represent. Now, the two reports published by committees in this parliament last week it were positive in this debate. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee produced a well-balanced report last Tuesday, and I would refer members to sections 96, 97, and also 98. Now, section 96 states, this report has been agreed at a time when there continues to be uncertainty about which bill or which combination of bills will be relied upon. Uh, and also, uh, our Finance and Constitution Committee report, although divided with the Conservatives ploughing a lonely furrow, uh, sometimes, also in the words of uh, Adam Tompkins, uh, utterly isolated and exposed, as he's quoted of in the past, but certainly the Conservatives ploughing a lonely furrow was clear in its position, particularly in sections 30, 75, 83, 96 and 97. Now, paragraph 30 of that report, which was unanimous, highlighted the UK government giving a political commitment that it will not normally use Clause 11 now 15 regulations without the consent of the devolved parliaments. Now, paragraph 75 calling for the Clause 1115 uh, to be removed was therefore understandable, and it was disappointing that the Conservatives disagreed with this position uh, to defend this parliament. Now, presenting also paragraph 83 then highlights the committee's unanimous view, highlighting the committee remaining deeply concerned about the lack of any statutory provision for the UK ministers to seek the consent of Scottish ministers or the Scottish Parliament to legislate in devolved areas. If the unanimous view of a parliamentary committee states that, then how can this parliament offer any trust towards the UK ministers that they will do the right thing by this parliament? Presenting officer, the UK population have heard the mantra of being strong and stable, and it's clear that anything that's happened since has proven to be anything but. It's more fast and loose. How can this parliament therefore offer any form of trust based upon a political commitment? A week is a long time in politics, as Wilson once stated, and as this Brexit process is proving to be a saga of epic proportions with an ending in sight, but yet to be written. Also, politicians come and go, so one political commitment now may be different when the Westminster political actors change, as they surely will. I urge all members to trust this parliament support this parliament and its powers and to reject the power grab that is at play. Please support the motion in the minister's name. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You'll notice I'm being a little generous with speeches because there is time in hand. We're not having many interventions. So you have another 30, 40 seconds to your speech. Uh, Neil Bibby, followed by Emma Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. Well, there has been much debate about the hugely important issues uh, about the customs union, the single market and the important issues of the Northern Ireland border, the Brexit debate in this parliament has been dominated by our response to the UK government's EU withdrawal bill. Brexit is entirely without precedent and so is the withdrawal bill. As we know, the bill would ensure the European Communities Act is repealed after more than 45 years. It would transpose all EU law into UK law and it would grant UK and Scottish ministers substantial new powers to shape the post-Brexit statute book. However, today's debate is not just about the purpose of the withdrawal bill, but about the challenge to the devolution settlement that the bill, particularly the old Clause 11, now Clause 15, presents. It is about whether we are willing to grant consent to a bill that constrains, as the Scottish Government state in their motion, the legislative and executive competence of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government. And my Scottish Labour 
colleagues and I are not willing to. Because this is about safeguarding devolution and it's about defending the principle that this Parliament may le legislate in all areas which are not explicitly reserved under the Scotland Act. Bruce Crawford earlier provided a summary of the Finance and Constitution Committee's latest report. There are three points that I want to echo from that report. Firstly, both the committee reports found overwhelming evidence that the old Clause 11 represented a fundamental shift in the structure of devolution, which was incompatible with the devolution settlement. The Scotland Act, the founding statute of this Parliament, makes clear that changes to competence should only be made with the explicit consent of the Scottish Parliament. While I recognise and welcome that the clause has been amended and it has been subject of ongoing negotiations, Scottish Labour cannot accept it in its current form. Secondly, the Secretary of State has given a political commitment that the UK Government will not bring forward legislation to modify retained EU law covering England where Clause 15 regulations apply, for as long as those regulations are in force and constraining devolution. However, it is not clear why the UK Government should be subject to its own voluntary constraints while the constraints placed on this Parliament are statutory. I continue to see no reason why there cannot be so-called standstill agreements based on mutual trust and understanding. The governments, the governments would agree not to bring forward legislation in areas where common frameworks are needed, and that would in turn negate the need for Clause 15 powers to be used. Finally, and on that point, the committee recommended that the intergovernmental agreement could provide an alternative. The agreement could be amended to include clear commitments from all the governments not to legislate where there is a common framework uh, likely to be needed. And it would represent a political solution to a constitutional dispute. President officer, I accept that the Conservative government may not have set out with the intention of weakening devolution or potentially sidelining this parliament, but that is what this bill could well do. To be fair, the Scottish Conservatives realised from the very beginning that the scope of powers being granted to ministers were unacceptable. They stood with other parties in demanding action and recognising that the withdrawal bill could not proceed unchecked and unamended. But now they are willing to accept a compromise for Scotland offered by the UK Government based on amendments which do not go far enough and which does not adequately address the concerns shared by every other party in the Parliament about new Clause 15 and by the Finance and Constitution Committee. And Conservative members are right that the Welsh Government have got a deal that works for Wales. But I remind them and the Chamber again that the preferred option of the Welsh Government is that the governments of the UK work together to find a common approach a common approach where there is no legislative constraints. That is Scottish Labour's preferred option too, and it should be the preferred option of everyone in this chamber, including the Scottish Conservatives. Even at this late stage, I appeal to the Scottish Conservatives to use their influence to try and make the UK government see sense. If there is a genuine willingness in the ranks of the Conservative Party to agree a workable solution, then they can come back with further proposals. President Officer, I would rather the dispute over the content of the withdrawal bill be resolved through dialogue because today we are not in a position to consent to it and that is a matter of regret. We have reached an impasse and neither the Scottish or UK governments seem able to resolve it. The time therefore has come for Parliament to step forward and assert itself. The time has come for representatives across the Parliament on all sides to be represented in talks with the Scottish and UK government ministers in order to ensure that a workable solution is reached. The Scottish Parliament, not just the Scottish Government, must be heard and there must now be a cross-party push to find a way forward and break the deadlock. That is the responsible thing to do, to look at alternatives and to reach a deal. And so, President Officer, today I will vote for the Labour Amendment to not only indicate our dissatisfaction with the EU withdrawal bill, but also to call for talks to be continued on a cross-party basis. I believe the deadlock is not insurmountable. There is still time for the EU withdrawal bill to be amended in the UK Parliament. And where there is a political will, there is a way. A solution still can be agreed if all parties represented in this chamber have the will to find it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bibby. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Ms. Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate. I'm a member of the Finance and Constitution Committee, and last Thursday we released our report on the European Union Withdrawal Bill Supplementary Legislative Consent Memorandum. 
I would like to also thank the members, the clerks and everyone who has participated in the committee work so far. Our committee concluded that there is still time for the UK Government to bring forward the required changes to the EU withdrawal from the European Union Bill. The committee's view, with the exception of the three Conservative members in the committee, is that the differences can be resolved through an emphasis on mutual trust and respect amongst governments across the UK. I want to repeat what our committee convener, Bruce Crawford, said. He said, there is scope for a reasonable solution to be found. If there is parity and both governments are treated equally and both are bound by political agreement, then this can be amicably resolved. The Secretary of State for Scotland, David Mundell, said he trusted the Scottish Government, and I welcome that, but it is time for his trust to be put into practice. And for that reason, our committee has reached the conclusion that Clause 11, which is now 15, and Schedule 3 of the EU Withdrawal Bill should be removed and for reciprocal political commitments to be included in the intergovernmental agreement. I'm interested in protecting the provenance of our Scottish brand, protecting the provenance and quality of our products from farm to fork. So during committee evidence, I was keen to explore the issue of pre protected geographical indication status for our specialist food and drink, not just in Scotland, but across the UK. There are only 65 products with protected status in the UK, and these are crucial. Scotch whisky, Scotch beef, Scotch lamb, Scottish wild salmon, Scottish farm salmon, just to name a few. We have already heard from elsewhere that the United States is pressuring the UK to drop geographical name protections after Brexit to allow supermarkets to import cheap American imitations. And it is not just a problem for Scotland. I'm sure the people of Cornwall don't want cheap imitation pasties made in Kentucky to be labelled Cornish. No more than we in Scotland want to see cheap whisky made in an industrial factory in Chicago to be labelled Scotch whisky, or artificially smoked fish from Alabama labelled Arbroath Smokies. Across the world, Scottish produce is kent for its provenance and quality. And recently, I met Tom Armstrong, the president of Dumfries and Galloway Chamber of Commerce. Tom visited China recently, and he told me that China wants the products of Scotland, they value the Scotch brand. They want high quality produce that is grown, nurtured and procured with the best standards which Scotland is known for. It is crucial that we protect and support Scottish producers from the wee jam makers like Galloway Chilies, who are making chilli preserves in Galloway, to the upland sheep farmers like Annan Water, who specialise in slow grown lamb, hogget and mutton. These small one woman and small one family businesses are similar across Scotland and many may go out of business if the UK makes trade deals that lower standards, lower protections and pursue cheap, lower quality products like chlorinated chicken and hormone injected beef. Common frameworks need not be agreed, need to be agreed but not absolutely imposed. We absolutely cannot impose common frameworks on the food producers, the farmers, the crofters, the growers that contribute so much to the economy of Scotland. In closing, presiding officer, I'd like to take a few words to talk about trust. In 2013, in an effort to pay cap payments more fairly, the EU paid an additional £190 million to the UK government for Scottish Hill farmers to bring them up to the average per hectare payments of all other EU countries. The EU and the Scottish Government trusted the UK Government to pay the £190 million to the Scottish Hill farmers. The UK Government didn't. The decision was made by the UK Government to only give £30 million to the Scottish farmers. Michael Gove promised to have a review about this money for Scottish Hill farmers, but I see he has now broken that promise. When we consider trusting the UK Government, we need to remember the three Ws. Yes, I will. Peter Chapman. The, the member speaks about uh, money coming from, from, uh, from London to, to, to uh, this government, this place here. What's like, what, what, would you like to comment on how the, the Scottish government gets, gets on in paying out money to the farmers north of the border? Emma Harper. 
I thank Peter Chapman for that intervention. What I would like to ask Peter Chapman is, will you confirm that the UK Government will not override the Scottish Parliament on common frameworks? When we consider trusting the UK Government, we need to remember the three Ws, the Windrush generation, the WASPy women and welfare cuts. Bruce Crawford quoted the wise words of US President Abraham Lincoln, and I will too. Abraham Lincoln once said, the people, when rightly and fully trusted, will return the trust. And I find it hard to see why our farming and food producing folk should trust the UK government with legislative common frameworks for agricultural support, animal welfare or food geographical indications. So I trust my government, presiding officer, and I support the government's motion today not to consent on the EU withdrawal bill. Thank you. I call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Alec Neil. Mr Fraser, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. When we last debated a legislative consent memorandum on the EU withdrawal bill, the position of the Scottish Conservatives was very clear and indeed reflected the stance taken by this whole parliament at that time. We felt that the EU withdrawal bill as presented did not properly reflect the devolution settlement and we therefore agreed that this parliament should not consent to it. A lot has changed in the intervening period. There have been substantial concessions made by the UK government, which means that our concerns about the bill, as previously raised, have now been addressed. And our position now is that this Parliament should therefore give consent to the EU withdrawal bill. We previously ad identified there were some 111 powers under discussion where, as they returned from the EU, would normally fall to be devolved. All but 24 of these will now be directly devolved back to Scotland. It has also been agreed that the remaining 24 will be subject to common frameworks to be agreed across the whole of the United Kingdom. Legislative powers in these areas will be held by Westminster only on a temporary, time-limited basis. So we will ensure, for example, that food labelling regulations will continue to be applied uniformly across the UK, thus protecting the UK domestic market rather than allowing regional deviation. I noticed that uh, on the Today programme this morning, the, the Brexit minister sitting on the front bench refused to accept there was such a thing as the UK single market. I think that will come as news to everybody involved in UK-wide trade, of course. Minister. It isn't my opinion. It is, uh, for example, Professor Drew Scott has written an article about it, which points, well, I can, well yes, I know, I, know, I know that the Tories hate experts, but, you know, I think reality should have a check. There is no a single market is a precise definition of what exists within the EU. There is undoubtedly a uniform, a unitary market. There's not a uniform market. So, well, clearly, clearly, as they don't like any information, there's no point in talking. Well, I think the minister. Is, uh, thank you, Deputy I think minister is tying himself in knots here. I think what what producers in Scotland want to know is that there will be seamless trade across our major market, that is the rest of the United Kingdom. That's what we're trying to protect. Now, presiding officer, the concerns we previously had were in line with those expressed by the Welsh Government. Indeed, Mr Russell, as the responsible minister, made it very clear previously there was no difference in view between the Scottish and Welsh Governments. He told this Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee last September, and I quote, we are working very closely with Wales and we cannot envisage a situation in which Scotland would be content and Wales would not be, or vice versa. And he talked separately about how the Scottish and Welsh governments worked in lockstep and how they were in exactly the same position. And what do the Welsh governments say now about the amended EU withdrawal bill? On the 24th of April, Mark... Drakeford, Mr Russell's counterpart in Wales, the Finance Secretary, welcomed the changes to the Brexit Bill with the following words. This is a deal we can work with which has required compromise on both sides. Our aim throughout these talks has been to protect devolution and make sure laws and policy in areas which are currently devolved remain devolved and this we have achieved. And as Adam Tonkins told us earlier, uh, he went on to say, London has changed its position so that all powers and policy areas rest in Cardiff and Edinburgh unless specified to be temporarily held by the UK government. These will be areas where we all agree common UK-wide rules are needed for
for a functioning UK internal market. London's, not just now, London's willingness to listen to our concerns and enter serious negotiations has been welcome. Presiding officer, there is a stark contrast between the warm language from the Welsh Government, starting in exactly the same place as the Scottish Government, which now recognises the changes that have been made to this bill, recognising the huge steps taken by the UK Government to find compromise and the carping tone we've heard from the SNP benches this afternoon. Indeed, we continue to see SNP representatives trying to misinterpret the effect of the EU withdrawal bill as now amended, for it is abundantly clear that this bill will not affect any power currently devolved to the Scottish Parliament. It applies only to EU retained law. These are powers currently being exercised at an EU level. So there is no Westminster power grab, as the SNP would claim. There's no question that, for example, the likes of GM crops on fracking could be imposed on Scotland against the wishes of the Scottish Parliament. Although I believe that in both these areas, the Scottish Government has got its policy wrong and should be listening to science and evidence rather than superstition and scaremongering. And if there were any, any doubt about that, then the statement from the Welsh Government makes it clear that the current devolved powers are in no way affected by the EU withdrawal bill and it is ludicrous to suggest otherwise. And we should not forget, Deputy Presiding Officer, that in relation to all the powers we are talking about under EU retained law, the SNP want to see every single one of them return to Brussels at the first opportunity and not devolved at all. This EU withdrawal bill is about delivering substantial additional powers to the Scottish Government and it should be welcomed for that reason. And yet, presiding officer, while the UK Government is delivering additional devolution, the First Minister writes hysterical newspaper articles claiming that the UK Conservatives are, and I quote, intent on demolishing devolution. And yet it is the SNP, not the Conservatives, who are opposing the devolution of these powers to this place and want to see them returned in their entirety back to Brussels. Presiding officer, there is only one explanation for the overblown rhetoric we've heard from the SNP and their attempt to ramp up a grievance agenda in light of the stance, the reasonable stance taken by the Welsh Government so far. It's nothing to do with good government, nothing to do with devolution, and all about trying to drum up support for a second independence referendum. No member of any party that claims to support the union should have anything to do with this nonsense. And it is a crying shame now here we have today members of the Labour Party and of the Liberal Democrats who claim they believe in the United Kingdom, aligning themselves with the separatists and the SNP, ignoring the stance taken by the Welsh Government, ignoring the stance taken by members of the Labour Party in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords, ignoring the comments of the likes of David Steele and Jim Wallace in the House of Lords, and giving succour to the nationalists. They should be ashamed of themselves, presiding officer. Presiding officer, if this parliament is serious about devolution, if it really wants more powers, it should reject the political posturing of the SNP and give its consent today to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I call Alec Neil to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr. Neil, please. It is a pleasure to follow the unifying voice of Murdo Fraser. Uh, can I say at the start of this uh, process of the and, I, and just for the record, and just for the record, I don't want to give the powers back to the EU. Uh, the, uh, right from the start of this uh, process about the withdrawal bill, presiding officer, the Conservatives have been asking privately and publicly whether the SNP ministers wanted a deal. There's never been any doubt in my mind whatsoever that the SNP ministers have acted in good faith and have tried everything to get a reasonable deal for Scotland. I think the question is, do the Tory ministers at Westminster actually want a deal? I think when Damien Green was there, I was fairly confident the answer to that question was yes. And although his successor, David Livington, who masterminds the Tory negotiations in this matter, is a very nice man, I've met him, uh, he, I will in a minute, he nevertheless doesn't, I think, understand devolution or understand Scotland. And in particular, the thing that the Tories have never got to grasp with is that although the United Kingdom is one state, we are four nations. 
and therefore Northern Ireland decides what's right for Northern Ireland. Wales decides rightly what's right for Wales. Scotland decides what's right for Scotland and ministers in London decide what's right for England. I will now take the intervention. And can I say to Ms Davison, please don't just remain standing the whole time waiting for your intervention. I wasn't can quite sit. sure how long he was going to be finishing up, so my apologies. None of us are, idea. but well, never I, mind, I, Ms Davison, on you I go. I understand the concern. Um, I'd like to thank the member for taking this intervention, and he asked if uh, we were sure that the UK government wanted a deal. And I would like to say that, yes, we are. That's why they did a deal with the Welsh government. It's also why they amended the deal that was on the table, re-amended the deal that was on the table. And how much movement did his government have in this process? Alec Newell. Well, I'm sure the member will listen intently. I'm about to explain to her why what's on the table is unacceptable. And it's unacceptable for two fundamental, two fundamental reasons. Despite what Murdo Fraser and Adam Tonk can say about these 24 powers coming back from Brussels to the UK, under the 1998 Scotland Act, it's very clear these 24 powers are devolved responsibilities and not part of the reserved list in Schedule 5 of that Act. And as devolved responsibilities, like all the other powers, they should come back directly to this parliament, not to this parliament via a number nine bus at Westminster. That's our responsibility to uh, manage and run these 24 devolved responsibilities. And let me also say two other points which are important, I think, to put in the record. The first one is that these 24 powers, when you look at them, matter. They matter to Scotland. The equivalent powers matter to England. They matter in Wales and they matter in Northern Ireland. So we're not dancing on the head of a pin. We're talking about powers that could have a real impact depending on how they're used in the economy of the entire United Kingdom or any part of the United Kingdom. I will in a minute, I will in a minute. The second point that has to be recorded is that we all have a common objective. We all agree on the need for common standards in certain matters over the entire United Kingdom. That's not the issue. The issue is how do you agree? What is the process for agreeing what those common standards should be? I will now take Mr Mundell. Oliver Mundell. We go. The member appears to make a pretty compelling case for uh, those common frameworks. And I'm interested in why he feels that this deal uh, doesn't deliver that. Alec Neil. I'm just about to explain. The first reason is these are devolved responsibilities. And if they're going to be taken by Westminster, it should be with our agreement per all the previous legislative requirements that have gone before the withdrawal bill. But the second point is this, and this is a very important point. When you look at the role of UK ministers in London, they have two heads ministerially. They have a United Kingdom head for non-devolved matters, and they have an English head to cover the English responsibility for England in devolved responsibilities. And what we have in offer is that these ministers, in effect, will be the final arbiter of what happens with these 24 powers. Now, they cannot be, as they represent England, they cannot be described as fair or neutral arbiters. What we need is a fair and neutral arbiter where there is a dispute. And there might not be that many disputes at the end of the day. And the current provision, where we can make a formal pres presentation to the House of Commons, is totally inadequate. No, I need to finish this point, because the arithmetic of the House of Commons, where 85% of the members represent constituencies in England, you can't expect a legislator in the uh, House of Commons representing an English constituency to vote against, no matter how reasonable our case, they're not going to vote against their own self-interest. So what is required to break this impact, impasse is agreement that there needs to be some genuinely neutral arbiter when and if there is a dispute. 
maybe some committee chaired by somebody who's agreeable to all four administrations. But you cannot really reasonable, reasonably either describe these two-headed ministers in London or the House of Commons as an uninterested party, as a neutral arbiter, as somebody do, who doesn't have a vested interest in a particular point of view. And that is a fundamental weakness of these proposals. So there is a way through this. There is a way through this. We all want a way through this. It doesn't do anybody any good to have a fight that's avoidable. This fight is avoidable. But reason must reign in London. And at the moment, that is not the case. And to say to the Scottish people, we're going to ignore the 1998 Act, both in spirit and in the letter, by changing it so that we don't require the uh, express approval of this parliament for what happens in Scotland, that, quite frankly, is treating the people with a total lack of respect and treating this parliament with a total lack of respect. So I say to the Tory benches, and I know some of you privately probably have a lot of sympathy with what everyone else is saying, and make no mistake about it, the Labour benches and the Liberal benches are genuine devolutionists. They fought hard with the Tory party to try to stop independence from happening in 2014. These benches are clearly in favour of independence. But when you've got people who are genuine devolutionists, who will fight tooth and nail against independence, uniting with, this, with us on this matter, there is a loud and clear message to the Tory government in London. And that is that it's high time that you not only saw reason, but you actually made an effort to implement it as well. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Mr Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm assuming I don't get an Alec Neil six minutes, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Can I begin no, by is saying... No, there is time in hand. Don't, okay. be, don't be naughty. Well, I'll, I'll see how, uh, how far I get. But I, I uh, stand with the... Degree. This debate has, I think, been almost two debates. We have had a debate which has sought to look at what the areas of common ground and how we actually might make some progress. But we also had a debate where people have been all too eager to point figures and cry betrayal. But I think that it's all too important that we have the pro former debate and not the latter, because what's at stake is devolution. And indeed, I think uh, Mike Russell uh, opened this debate well, I think, by setting out the achievements of devolution. And we have achieved a great many things from this place. But I think he missed one of the greatest achievements of, of uh, devolution, which is that it has been stable, it has been robust, but it has also been dynamic. I think the strength of devolution is marked by the lack of this kind of dispute that we've had, because that isn't always had these sorts of issues resolve themselves in uh, nation states which have multiple levels of governance and legislatures. One thinks of the United States, a form of federal government which has almost been uh, uh, marked by its dispute between state and federal level, whether it was the, the use of the National Guard at the University of Alabama to make sure that all citizens could ac access to that state university or through to the New Deal, the New Deal which was blocked by federal government initially, was spearheaded by state government. The US is a country that's been marked by dispute. But that has not been the nature of devolution here. No, what we must do is protect the clarity that the reserved and devolved model uh, has provided us. And that is what is at stake today. And indeed, we must reflect on the powers that are coming from the EU because it was not ever conceived that these 24-hour powers would ever be up for consideration. Brexit was not conceived when the powers were set out in the Scotland Act. We had re reserved uh, powers, everything else being resolved, but there was also uh, a separately uh, uh, provided for European powers. So the status of whether they were devolved or reserved uh, essentially was not considered. And when we look at the nature of these powers, them being very much about market regulation, and we've just heard from, from Alex Neil, but also Emma Harper and Morris Golden set out. I think it is clear why we need resolution, why we need common frameworks. So the argument here is not necessarily about 
whether or not we need common frameworks or whether about things about devolution. It is about dispute. How we arrive at conclusion when there is not agreement between governments. And the problem with the, the legislation as it stands, as it stands at Westminster right now, is that it defaults to the decisions of the UK government. That yes, that in the first instance, consent is sought, but if it fails, then the decision of the UK government is what stands. And I think the mistake that is being made by some members is that to assume that it's simply about a categorization of powers. We've heard from Adam Tompkins that it's simply about dancing on the head of pin. It is not. Because that is to make the mistake that it's only about where powers lie. And yes, that is important, but there are three important considerations. One is where powers lie, but secondly is what direction power flows. Is it top down or is it bottom up? And finally is how do we uh, come to agreement when there is disagreement? And I think that is fundamentally important. And can I just say this to Murdo Fraser? Well, he accuses parties on this side of the House of betraying the union. Can I say it's no such thing? The real betrayal of, uh, of the union is to, to uh, invoke constitutional crisis and threaten devolution itself because the union relies on the devolution settlement. It is really quite that simple. And it's his party that is putting it at threat. But this it fundamentally comes down to a division between trust and a lack of trust perhaps from the Scottish Government and a fundamental lack of understanding of devolution from the UK Government. The UK Government has failed to understand not just how devolution works but the importance of devolution to Scottish people because it is the Scottish Parliament that Scottish people see as the natural locus of power in Scotland and there's been a fundamental failure of recognition of that point. But the Scottish Government has failed to demonstrate any form of trust at all. There's been an assumption that there would be bad faith in this process. So, uh, of course. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. Can he point to any action of the UK government throughout this Brexit crisis which deserves to have trust given in the word that they give? And does he accept that if they legislate on this bill without our consent, they will absolutely have justified the lack of trust that I personally absolutely feel. Daniel Johnson. On that latter point, I would agree with the member that if they legislate on this bill without consent, that would demonstrate a lack of trust. However, they have moved, but we must move them further. And as my colleague Neil Bibby set out very clearly, we must find, an, and indeed I think a political settlement and solution is possible. The nature of these powers has been uh, governed in a in a complicated way as they stand at the moment. The exercise of the EU powers in terms of the, the European frameworks is complicated using Byzantine uh, 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 procedures in Council of Ministers, uh, the European Commission and qualified majority voting. Surely it is simpler to find a mechanism, a, 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 a way of finding agreement between four nations. That, surely that is easier than finding agreement between 27. So a political solution must be sought, it can be sought, and that is why the Labour Party from these benches is standing behind the proposal for multi-party talks to find that solution, to find that mechanism. But ultimately, devolution is not static. It has changed, it has evolved, uh, even through crisis. Even at the very moment where some parties from this place sought to use um, the, their majority to break up the United Kingdom, to seek independence. It was by through agreement, the Edinburgh Agreement, that, that the way forward was found. And I think it is remarkable, in a sense, that the UK government would come to an agreement over such a fundamental issue. And it is a shame that the UK government has forgotten that, that uh, uh, culture of consensus uh, as a way, way and means of finding solutions and ways forward through the devolution sentiment. So, Finally, presiding officer, no one will thank us for grandstanding. And indeed, as Neil Finlay pointed out at the beginning, this in many ways is a distraction from the real issues we were sent here to solve, such as tackling inequality, tackling poverty, and securing good work for all Scots. But we must end this uncertainty, and both governments need to get back around the table to find a mechanism for dealing uh, with uh, coming up with the, the frameworks, which we all agree must be found. Thank you. Christina McKelvey, followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you very much, P President Officer. We've heard today the chaotic muddle that is Brexit is set to take away a lot more than jobs and trade. Without the removal of the clause formerly known as a living, we enable Theresa May's government to begin dismantling the very framework upon which this Scottish Parliament was reconvened. What is not reserved 
is therefore devolved. That's the words in that agreement. And like a cut that begins with a trickle then develops into an arterial gush, the damage that is Brexit is leaking and spreading. Scotland alone has 134,000 people in jobs supported by EU trade. Skilled EU nationals leaving these shores every day. I know many of them, including those in health and social care sectors, people that we need greatly in these areas. And a hard Brexit could lead to a loss of 8.5% of GDP in Scotland by 2030, equivalent to £2,300 per individual. That is a remarkable impoverishment with unthinkable consequences for individuals, families and our society as a whole. Now, on top of this insult comes the potential for real constitutional attack. We are facing a blatant and highly alarming attempt to begin withdrawing the very powers under which the Scottish Parliament was reconvened. David Mundell has repeatedly refused to say that the Scottish Government would not overrule a decision of the Scottish Parliament to withhold its consent on the EU withdrawal bill. Adam Tomkins. Very grateful to Christina McKelvey for giving way. Will she please identify even a single power that this Parliament currently has which is under threat and being taken away by this bill? Christina McKelvey. All of them, because quite frankly, President Officer, I don't trust these people with any of them. Under the current powers, the current UK Government proposal, we could see the powers of the Scottish Parliament change without the consent of this Parliament for the first time ever. And it's a very interesting definition of consent that we have in these proposals, as Patrick Harvey has pointed out. Not a definition that I understand. Is this Mrs May's strategy for dismantling the devolved powers that we have worked so hard to retrieve, I wonder? The Scottish Government is not opposed to UK-wide frameworks when these are in Scotland's best interest. We know that. What we won't tolerate is being ignored, punished and kicked to the side by those who want imperial control. We need trust and respect. Qualities in very short supply in the UK Government, in many cases in this chamber, presiding officer, to agree proposals without them being imposed upon us and that's the important point here imposed upon us not for us but against us this is arguably the most serious attack in Scottish democracy since this parliament re was reconvened nearly 20 years ago a proud day for many of us we all worked long and hard to make devolution work and it has largely been successful we have made Scotland a better place behaved with wisdom justice integrity well some of us compassion and mostly dignity and in doing so we have won national and international respect as a parliament we should never do that down this is something all of us all of us in this chamber can be justifiable take justifiable pride in presiding officer the scotland act was created which created this place opened with the now famous words there shall be a scottish parliament words immortalized on the mace which sits in front of us today those words were not just an aspiration, they were a promise, a promise to our people, a statement that old wrongs would be righted. A declaration of intent, yes, that our new democracy would be modern, civilised, forward thinking and we would be the keeper of our own house. The words that brought this parliament into being most assuredly did not say there shall be a Scottish Parliament subject to the winds of convenience of politicians in London who can strip away its powers for their own ends whenever it suits them without consent. That's not what those words say. We are not going to surrender what we have achieved. We are not going to hold the door open while Mrs May and her acolytes trample all over this place and threaten to close us down if we don't behave ourselves and do what we are told. Sounds a bit dystopian, doesn't it? Well, I never thought I would become, it would become normal to tell someone with a terminal brain tumour that they were fit for work. And I didn't think either that a family using its small third bedroom to keep dialysis equipment for its young son would be ever told to pay a bedroom tax. Dystopian. I do not trust these people with my country. I didn't think either that that family would have to face those tragedies and trials the way we are having to face them today. Presiding officer, EU laws preside us with protections and employment rights, equality rights, the right to belong to any religion or none, to have a safe home and food and livestock fan, uh, standards that cover the quality and provenance of the meat and other food that we eat. The UK government seems to be rubbing its hands with glee while pondering which EU laws to, with, to delete or withdraw. 
The lack of any commitment in this bill to the Charter of Fundamental Rights tells us everything we need to know. They ask us to trust them. Can we, when we, see, can we do that when we see they do not actually trust us? The door could soon be open to fracking, GM crops and eating chlorinated chicken, nothing that I want to see. I can never accept this attack on our freedom, presiding officer, our democracy or our right to do what's best for the best interests of our nation, the nation of Scotland. And I am confident that this parliament feels the same. It can be and we will defend anybody who undermines the powers of this Scottish Parliament. Presiding officer, call it defiance if you will, but in the philosopher and the wolf, Mark Rowlands reminds us, in the end, it is our defiance that redeems us. So with belief and resolution, let us redeem ourselves today, support the motion and tell the UK government to get back to the table and talk to us in a manner that, d that demands that respect. Donald Cameron, followed by Richard Lockhead. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, this motion is, of course, being debated today in tandem with the equivalent motion in the Welsh Assembly, just before the third reading of the bill in the House of Lords tomorrow. Wales and Scotland were, of course, meant to present a united front. It was claimed both governments shared an identity of purpose and stood together. The minister was quite clear. He couldn't envisage a situation in which Scotland would be content and Wales would not be, or vice versa. Except it hasn't quite worked out that way. The Welsh Government hasn't played ball. The Welsh Government has quite reasonably concluded that the present deal protects devolution and has signed up to it. Mark Drakeford, the Labour Welsh Minister, has said this very afternoon. We have defended and entrenched our devolution settlement. We have provided for the successful operation of the UK after Brexit. We have provided a good deal for the Assembly and a good deal for Wales. Good enough for Mr Drakeford, but not good enough for Mr Russell. I wonder why. Course. Michael Russell. Completeness, one should also quote something else that Mark Drakeford said this afternoon. He said that uh, it was right for Wales to back down while Scotland fights on because Wales voted leave and Scotland voted remain. Oh, well. Donald Cameron. Well, if that's the, that's the excuse given, then of course you must accept it. But there's been much talk, much talk about the devolution settlement, presiding officer, in the House of Lords debate last week. Lord Hope, the most senior Scottish judge in that legislature, made an important point when he counselled against elevating the 1998 Scotland Act beyond its statement, status, saying the purest argument that a principle does not really apply here. We are dealing with a different, more subtle situation in trying to create a functioning internal market with what has come back to us from Europe. Other commentators have said the same. The 1998 Act is not some sacred text which operates in a vacuum, not least when it never envisaged Brexit. In that sense, no, I'd like to make some progress, please. In that sense, I would suggest that Clause 11, as amended, is another step in the evolution of devolution. No more, no less. It has rightly addressed the significant concerns that many people had about its original form, including on these benches. It is now more targeted and proportionate. It is built on the principle of collaborative working, balanced against the responsibility of the UK Parliament, not the UK Government, but the UK Parliament, to act where there is an impact across the UK in the interest of the UK as a whole. And in so doing, the bill will give protection to the UK internal market and the many jobs and businesses which depend on it. And anyone voting against consent tonight should bear that in mind. The demands of the SNP, on the other hand, would lead to a devolved administration, any devolved administration, possessing an absolute veto on matters which have serious implications for the whole of the UK, and it's that which truly puts, truly puts, um, it's that which truly threatens devolution. It also puts some of the hyperbole into perspective, not least the blood-curdling accusation that the Scottish Conservatives want to completely demolish devolution. What, when it was a Conservative government that extended devolution so significantly in 2016? When it was a Conservative government that en enacted the Smith Commission and was responsible for the transfer of powers over income tax and welfare powers a mere two years ago? And as for the power grab sloganeering, sad to see the Minister even stoop this low. But not one power of this Parliament is being removed, presiding officer. Not one. In no way will this Parliament stand diminished as a result of this bill. It will stand enhanced. 111, I'm sorry, I don't have time. 111 additional powers of which only 24 
require a UK common framework, frameworks which even the SNP accept are necessary. The actual dispute here is over the temporary solution which is necessary while permanent frameworks are being established. Clause 11 doesn't seek to construct everlasting cons constitutional foundations, but merely a temporary one. And whilst we're on power grabs, let me turn to the greatest irony of all. Every power coming back to the UK and Scotland, the SNP would prefer to be returned to Brussels. Imagine the scene, presiding officer, an independent Scotland rejoining the EU, the Scottish Government coming to this chamber and explaining that each and every one of these 111 powers now had to be automatically surrendered to Brussels. No question of consent, these powers would be swiftly gathered in, packaged up and transferred to the EU to languish in some dusty Brussels corridor in the hands of the European Commission. Yes, Gillian. Gillian Martin. I would agree that one of, the, one of the, the aspects of his job is actually to make sure that whatever comes back from the UK government into this planet affects Scotland is actually voted on and scrutinised by the people that are elected to this parliament. Donald Cameron. Well, we, even, your own part, even your own government accepts there is a need for common frameworks in certain areas of, the, of, of, of what comes back from EU retained law. The fact is, is that this would be devolution in reverse if the SNP wanted to return all the powers back to Brussels. They have perpetrated many myths during this sorry saga, but the power grab myth is the greatest sham of all, presiding officer. Because what the SNP demanded, the UK agreed to. The SNP demanded recognition that powers be, would be presumed to sit at a devolved level, conceded. The SNP demanded co-decision making was an imperative. Clause 11 sets out a collaborative approach. The SNP demanded a sunset clause, conceded. Concession after concession has been made by the UK government with absolutely no movement from the Scottish government in return. Again, I wonder why. Now, I respect Mike Russell. He is a pragmatic politician who I believe would have done a deal had not others intervened. For the SNP, it's not about identity of purpose. It's about the politics. It always is. And the politics only point in one direction for the SNP, as ever, their eyes are on a different prize. This is just the latest move by the SNP in their game of constitutional chess, their latest gambit aimed at agitating the Scottish population towards a different outcome. And, presiding officer, in conclusion, this is a sad day. Sad because the issues at stake could have been so easily resolved if trust had been maintained. Sad because once principled unionist parties prefer a short-term strike to a long-term deal in the interest of devolution. And sad because yet once more we debate in this chamber matters on the Constitution at the expense of practical everyday issues affecting the lives of those whom we are privileged to represent. Thank you, President. Richard Lockhead, followed by Gillian Martin. Well, I have to confess that I am one of the oldies in that I was here in 1999 for the fanfare of the opening of the Scottish Parliament. And every time since then I've spoken in debates about powers for the Scottish Parliament, it's always been about new powers coming to the Scottish Parliament and talking about the vision and the imagination and ambition of what we can do with these new powers to build a better Scotland. So it's very regrettable and it's very sad that today I'm standing here having to speak about a threat to the powers of the Scottish Parliament and a threat to take powers away from the Scottish Parliament. And we should all be clear that today is a really important day in the history of devolution. And hopefully as many of us as possible can stand together and defend our parliament when it's under threat. The people of Scotland went to the polls in the June 2016 EU referendum and voted remain. Parts of the UK voted leave, so we're leaving the EU. But I expect the 38% of Scots who voted to leave in Scotland did not actually appreciate that by voting to leave the EU, they perhaps were going to contribute towards or give the ability to the UK government to deliver a threat to the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Indeed, it's ironic that people who voted leave voted to decentralise power away from Brussels to the UK, but that vote in itself is now leading to the UK government under the guise of Brexit to centralise powers potentially back from this Parliament back to London. And that's an irony that this Parliament should absolutely tackle. 
Now, I have no doubt whatsoever that people across the country today watching this debate or hearing about it in the news will expect MSPs, members of the Scottish Parliament, to stand together for the national interest and to protect the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Because devolution is under threat. What started as a debate post-Brexit about the need for government to, or uh, uh, UK frameworks uh, following Brexit has now resulted in the UK government wanting to be able to negotiate in devolved areas without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, the undermining of devolution. So that uh, case for common frameworks in the 24 areas of policy where the UK government say they may want to legislate, uh, is there's a good case for that because we all accept there should be UK common frameworks. It makes sense. We share the same islands and some of the same priorities in many of the issues. But then for that to move into new ground of the UK government wanting to the ability to, uh, to, to legislate and tackle devolution is something completely different. And when Adam Tompkins stands up in the debate and says that these UK frameworks are very important so we don't undermine the integrity of the UK or jeopardise the UK's internal market, to me that is just euphemism for the UK government wanting the ability to put the brake on Scotland doing anything different to the rest of the UK within devolved areas. Now, the UK says it won't impose regulations in the 24 areas, but I think the committee, the Finance and Constitution Committee, makes a very good point in paragraph 51, where it says the committee's view is that this commitment that common frameworks will not be imposed is contradicted by the consent decision mechanism created by the UK government's amendments to Clause 11, which would allow the UK government to proceed with regulations without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. And what's really, really important in this debate is to look closely at the 24 areas where the UK potentially want to regulate without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Let's look at those areas. Agricultural support, GMOs, animal welfare, environmental quality and waste packaging and product regulations, fisheries management and support, food labelling, nutritional health claims, composition and labelling. Just some of the 24 areas. All areas where the UK government may, by their past track record, want to take a different policy position than the Parliament here in Scotland. Now, we're talking about powers coming back from Brussels to the UK. And those powers, of course, were negotiated by the UK with Scottish ministers in attendance in Brussels for many, many years. For nine years, I attended those uh, negotiations in Brussels. And I often found that there was often a resentment towards devolution from many of the UK Secretary of State. And what that meant was they did not like policy positions being adopted by the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government that perhaps were not flavour of the month with the party in power at UK government level. So if you look at fishing, for instance, one area where the UK government might potentially want to regulate without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, there was an issue where the UK government supported the privatisation of fish quota. Just think for, about that for a second. The privatisation of billions of pounds worth of Scottish fish quota that would be open for anyone across the world to buy up denying opportunities for fishing communities to fish their own waters. There's also the fact that the UK government top slice UK quota before then it's divvied up between the devolved nations and the rest of the UK, a double benefit for fishermen south of the border by the fact, as Alec Neil highlighted, UK ministers often have to wear two hats. There's the issue of agricultural support, where the UK government regularly in EU negotiations take a position where we must not have direct support to Scottish farmers or the rest of the UK farmers. And the only reason why we continue to have direct support for farmers in Scotland is because the UK were outvoted by the rest of the EU member states. So ask yourselves, what the, what's the position going to be post-Brexit when we're not protected by the EU? So to summarise in terms of the, the, the 24 areas, the reason I believe why the UK government want to have the option of regulating in those areas without the consent of the Scottish Parliament is to stop Scotland doing something different and doing what we were elected to do. And for Adam Tompkins of the Conservative Party to create this new, uh, new category of devolved powers, so we have devolved powers uh, that we have at the moment, and apparently they're being protected. Then we have reserved powers, which are called the Scotland Act, the same with the UK government. And now we have the third category of powers, which are the, the issues that are devolved, but used to be decided by Europe. And they should actually stay with the UK government, or the UK government should have the ability to regulate on those. The point is that within the UK, Fishing, farming, the other 24 powers are devolved. There's not a third category. Once these powers come back from Brussels to the UK, they are devolved, and that's why they should come to this Parliament. So I urge all parties to stand together and protect the Scottish Parliament and protect devolution today. It's a shame the Conservative Party are not getting behind this. 
It seems that when it comes to devolution, at best they're lukewarm, and at worst, it's only political expediency that leads the Scottish Conservatives to support devolution in this country. But the rest of us, we can stand together, we can get behind this parliament, and we can get uh, behind each other to protect devolution in this afternoon's vote. And I urge us all to do that in the sake of for Scottish democracy. The last of the open debate contributions is from Gillian Martin. Officer, a fundamental responsibility of members of this parliament is to ensure that its powers cannot be diminished without the consent of the people of Scotland. And the EU withdrawal bill, to which we're asked to give our consent, gives that power over to the UK government and aims to press ahead, even if that consent is not given today. Now, the EU withdrawal bill, as amended, would grant UK ministers the ability to restrict the powers of Scottish ministers. It would, uniquely for the first time ever in devolution, give UK ministers the right to use secondary legislation to alter the devolved competencies of the Scottish Parliament, and that affects each and every single one of us. I am deeply concerned about the lack of any statutory provision within the EU withdrawal bill for UK ministers to seek the consent of Scottish ministers or the Scottish Parliament to legislate in devolved areas because this ultimately undermines the competence of our parliament and it goes against the constitution. Now, no one is arguing that there shouldn't be UK common frameworks, but their formation should be a joint negotiation between parliaments, not an imposition of one parliament's will over others. And we should have the right to vote on whether we accept them if, when and if they affect devolved areas, as we have done for 20 years. So take agriculture, and Richard Lockhead has, has made mention of this in his speech to the point where I should just say what he said. But in Scotland, 85% of Scottish agricultural land is classed as less favoured areas, which takes into account the challenging geographical conditions facing many of Scotland's farmers and crofters. Now, we know that the UK government has confirmed that all UK farmers will continue to receive the current level of EU subsidies until 2024, but there's still so many questions to be answered on a replacement. So if an LFAS type scheme is unable to continue, the impact, no thank you Mr Chapman, the impact on rural Scotland would be devastating. And a month ago I asked whether the UK government had carried out an impact assessment on LFAS withdrawal from the Scottish agricultural sector, and the answer was no. And the recent delay by the UK government to the promised review into how EU convergence uplift payments are distributed also doesn't inspire confidence on common frameworks being entrusted solely to Whitehall. If this Parliament grants its consent to the EU withdrawal bill, we cede power over the formation of frameworks for agricultural support to a government who neither understands nor prioritises rural Scotland. And of course, fisheries are devolved and decisions that affect the regulations of Scot Scottish waters and vessels should be made in Scotland for obvious reasons that have been outlined by so many of my colleagues. As Stuart Stevenson said earlier in his intervention to the minister, um, a recently leaked Westminster finish, fisheries paper showed that the UK government intends to retain a veto over international uh, negotiations. And this suggests that the UK government is intent on imposing arrangements on Scotland. When it comes to a Brexit negotiation, negotiating point, I just don't trust the UK government to prioritise fishing over, say, the car industry. No, thank you. And the interests of Scottish fish industry would be, for that reason, be best loan served for the Scottish government being front and centre as those frameworks are negotiated, not waiting for a top-down edict which we can't vote on in this parliament. And I'm also concerned that the withdrawal bill sets a precedent for other Brexit-related UK legislation, in particular the trade bill. Now, regardless of the precedent we consent today, we also cede power on procurement decisions. With EU procurement arrangements being out the window, what could that mean as Liam Fox ties himself in knots courting the favour of Donald Trump over trade? Now, a relaxation of procurement laws could well be tied up in a trade arrangement with the US that could see our public services adversely affected. I mean, could this impact on NHS Scotland? Well, I don't want us to be in a situation where we can't scrutinise those bills and vote on them. And the, so, the Conservatives should be standing alongside all of us on that. The UK government has also refused to rule out the weakening of food and drink standards through trade deals. And the result of this may be the influx of low-grade products, as Emma Harper mentioned earlier in her speech. And Ross Finney of the Food Standards Scotland's uh, agency said, 
it will be difficult for Scottish stakeholders' voices to be heard or for the needs of businesses or consumers in Scotland to be given priority. The reservation of these powers to Westminster would prevent his organisation from operating effectively. And our government is trying to prioritise tackling obesity and alcoholism. Reservation of UK of policy and legislative frameworks on food standards and labelling mean that Scotland would not have the competence to regulate in this area in order to improve public health. And we all know about the issue with Scotch whisky and the EU protected food name schemes that are in operation at the moment. There's still no answers on them either. So you see a direction of travel, which I don't think is particularly good for Scotland. So why would we want to relinquish any of our legal ability to legislate in devolved areas or accept new frameworks without the ability to actually vote on them? And Bruce Crawford is right. We've been asked to trust the UK government when they do not trust devolved governments. Take Clause 15 and Section 3 of the Withdrawal Bill and respect the Constitution and the people of Scotland. And let's not forget that the people of Scotland did not vote for any of this. But who might feel a lot better about the situation if they know that their parliament are representing them in a devolution settlement that they most definitely did vote for. We now move to the closing speeches and I would take this opportunity to remind all members that if a member has taken part in the debate, they should be present for the beginning of the closing speeches. And I move to James Kelly for around six minutes, please, Mr Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking the Finance Committee officials and clerks and witnesses for the work that they put in in the production of the committee report, which was the platform for uh, this debate. Um, this is an important part of the process. However, it's not the end of the process. And that's why Labour tonight will support the government motion signalling that Parliament would not give its consent uh, to the LCM on the EU withdrawal bill, but also puts forward an amendment urging cross-party talks uh, involving uh, Mr Russell and also David Liddington. I think we've had uh, a number of, the, over the months we've had a number of debates uh, on this crucial issue and the, the debates have centred around the powers, the allocation of powers and how disputes have been resolved and where essentially we've got to in the issue around Clause 11 which has now become uh, Clause 15 is that there was a real frustration around the original Clause 11 even shared by the Conservatives in that the, the list of powers essentially would be taken to a UK level rather than devolved uh, to the Scottish Parliament. The latest proposal from the UK uh, Parliament tries to, to resolve that, uh, but essentially it doesn't deal properly with the issue of dispute resolution. So what would happen if, the, if there were power, powers in terms of retained EU law which had been taken temporarily uh, into the, the UK Parliament and there was a dispute over that and the Scottish Parliament didn't consent to it. That dispute would be resolved on the floor of the House of Commons and the Scottish Parliament uh, wouldn't have a vote on that. Ministers would have a say but not have a vote. Uh, and therefore that, what that creates is it creates a power uh, imbalance. And I think that's the fundamental issue that Labour, the Liberal Democrats, the SNP and the Greens have with the proposal that has been put forward. Uh, from that point of view, um, I do think it's important to recognise the point that Neil Finlay made, that the motion before us today is only a motion expressing a view. It's not the end of the process. And therefore, the proposal uh, for cross-party talks, which, which has been positively uh, received by Mike Russell, and there has been some positive indication also from David Lennington, it uh, should be explored. I think Patrick Harvey, um, who I know is very exasperated by the whole process, is perhaps too keen to, to reach the end. I think it's important to bring all the parties into the process. I think Alec Neil made a very, uh, just let me finish this point, Mr Harvey. I think Alec Neil, I'm oh, sorry, I'll take you now. Patrick Harvey. And uh, James Kelly knows that I haven't said that we'll oppose their amendment. I'm sceptical 
that a, another round of talks will offer anything. Can, can Labour actually say what they expect to have happen as a result of that? If the UK government aren't going to relent and reverse their position, then what else is there? James Kelly. I actually think this debate's been, been very useful in the terms that we've actually had some uh, practical suggestions. I mean, Alec Neil was right to point out that if you get a situation where Labour and the Liberal Democrats, who both opposed uh, independence, and the SNP and the Greens, who both supported independence, get round the table uh, and explore the issues with the UK government as a potential way forward. We heard from Neil Bibby uh, making a very powerful contribution in uh, putting forward the case for an intergovernmental agreement. We also heard from Alec Neil on the possibility of maybe a committee of the, the, the regions of the different parliament that could resolve disputes. So that shows that there's still possibilities out there that can be explored by cross-party talks. And I would urge Patrick Harvey uh, to, take, to take that on board. Um, I think Daniel Johnson was right to point out that Mike Russell's contribution uh, emphasised the, the merits of devolution. And I think the opportunity here, if this can be handled correctly, is to actually not only protect the devolution process, but also enhance the devolution process. Because there's an opportunity, if we can get these common frameworks right and get them uh, set up in such a way that they're agreed by both governments, then we can assure that the, the, the powers that will come to this parliament will, will actually enhance devolution. Uh, Neil Finlay quoted the example of procurement. I think that gives a really powerful opportunity to ensure not only fa fairer award of contra procurement contracts in Scotland, but also the implementation of policies that would help grow the Scottish economy uh, in a fair manner. Uh, and summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, I think there's an onus on all the parties uh, in the chamber not only to send a signal to tonight that the current settlement on the table uh, is not acceptable, but that we're not going to give up on that. There's a real opportunity moving forward with these cross-party talks to influence the, the process of the final uh, House of Lords consideration, also House of Commons consideration. And I think there's a duty to ensure that that happens because not to do so would head down a, a disastrous route where we end up in the courts we end up in a potential chaotic situation and that would not serve the people that, uh, that were been sent here from this to, to serve in this parliament well. I call Jackson Carlaw for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, pr uh, presiding officer. Um, can I start, hopefully, a note of agreement with Mike Russell and that I think when this whole process began, uh, neither of us hoped or expected that this is where we would be this afternoon, but it is indeed where we are. And I want just to refer back to the contribution of Scottish Conservatives during this, this whole exchange, because I think even he might maybe express some surprise back in September when he looked around the chamber and asked for support from all sides, that he looked across to us, not expecting to find it uh, to be forthcoming, but to his surprise found that it was. Uh, we did accept that the withdrawal bill as published was unacceptable. We listened. We have worked to try and reflect and represent the concerns of the Scottish Government because our whole objective was to get to a point where they would feel able to recommend to this Parliament the approval of an LCM this afternoon. We noted the various requests that the Scottish Government made and we believe that, achievement, uh, that changes have been achieved. I don't see Bruce Crawford in the chamber, but he referred earlier on when he spoke on behalf of the committee uh, to the fact that, achievement, that changes had actually been achieved to the bill, uh, and, I, and, I, and I respect the fact that he did. But we also explained that that negotiation had to take account of other factors as well, and I tried in the last debate that we had on this to say that this isn't a bilateral discussion, this is a quadlateral discussion, and that the UK government and other parties in the other parts of the United Kingdom were concerned that in the frameworks that had to be established, there had to be a process of agreement, but that also had to take account of the fact that the expectation that the Scottish Government could exercise a veto over what would ultimately be decided was not an acceptable outcome either. Now, I think it's important to emphasise, um, despite the way that some might wish to characterise it, that our responsibility in these benches is not simply to represent the UK Government's view, 
but to offer a considered reflection by the Scottish Conservatives of the UK government's position. And that is why throughout the whole process, even in the new year, we expressed frustration with the way progress was being made. We expressed frustration at the lack of an alternative Clause 11 coming forward and being put on the table. But why we now believe, as do the government in Wales, as do Labour peers in the House of Lords, as do Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords, I'm not even sure if the Liberals have consulted with their two Scottish MPs in the House of Commons as to whether they entirely share the views of Liberal Democrats. I think there are some doubts being expressed this afternoon that that is the case. They, we managed to achieve uh, changes, and those changes reflected many of the, re the requests Mike Russell made. He said that the problem was with the word agree, I may in due course. Uh, we, he said that the, the difference, uh, that the, the problem agreed uh, was there with the word agree. Agree. The Clause 11 was a changed into the new Clause 15, which expressly uses the word agreement. He talked about the need for a sunset clause. A sunset clause is now there. He talked about the need for there to be co-decision making, and that is what the whole process of the new Clause 11 actually is designed to achieve. Mr. Russell, in his opening, gave rather a sentimental introduction about the origins of devolution, to which I think everybody would uh, lend their support. I disagree thereafter with the conclusions that he drew. Adam Tom can set out in detail our analysis of the actual bill as now amended and specifically of the amendments that have been made and the effect those changes would have. And he quoted from Mark Drayford. And I heard what Mr. Russell said uh, in response to the Labour Party about uh, Mark Drayford by saying that he seemed to believe that they were more determined in Wales now to achieve Brexit than they were to stand up for the principles of devolution. I thought that was both ungenerous and unfounded. I don't believe that is the case at all. And I believe that the government in Wales came to believe through the course of negotiations that the outcome, just as David Steele, just as Jim Wallace, just as Labour peers in the House of Lords did, that the agreement that had been arrived at was reasonable. Yeah. Neil Finlay stood up and said that this whole problem was because uh, David Mundell, Ruth Davidson, David Liddington had failed to achieve a new Clause 11. They said they would. They did achieve a new Clause 11. Yeah. It's a Clause 11 that the Labour Party in Wales support. It's a Clause 11 that no Labour peer in the House of Lords yeah. spoke against. And I turned to Tavish Scott, who gave a long list of all the things Labour, Liberal peers did speak against in the House of Lords. They didn't speak against the particular provisions that we are discussing this afternoon, which makes a nonsense of your argument. It always disproves the point that you made. And I might come back, I'll come back to Mr. Scott in a moment. I'll come back to you in a moment. Not only that, but Leslie Laird as well. Well, I've got a cue and I'll give way to Mr. Finlay first. Neil Finlay. I wonder if Mr. Carlaw could tell us why, when Labour put forward proposals in the House of Commons that would have resolved this, that would have saved all of these discussions. Well, oh, ask him the answer. Go and ask him the answer because you don't know. Why did the Tories get whipped to vote against it? Jackson the same way that in this Parliament, at stage one of a process, amendments aren't considered. Amendments are then considered at the report stage, and that's exactly what happened. And we're now at a point. We're now at a point where Labour in the House of Lords, Labour in Wales agree, but not Mr. Finlay. And of course, one has led to the conclusion that the Labour Party in Scotland see the political expedient argument and not actually the principal argument of devolution at all. And then we've heard arguments about a power grab. We just passed a welfare bill within the last fortnight, which arose as a result of new powers being transferred to this parliament. Derek Mackay produced a budget which increased taxes, which we opposed, but a budget which increased taxes because of new powers that the Westminster government had transferred to this parliament. As a result of this bill that's going through uh, the Westminster as we leave Europe, there will be the most enormous transfer of powers to Scotland. This is not a power grab, it's a power transfer, a power transfer to the Scottish parliament. I, I did enjoy Mr Scott's entertaining constituency association lunch speech from last Saturday and I'm sure six of them round the table all found it very amusing but he had nothing to say at all about the debate we're having this afternoon. We heard all manner of arguments this afternoon. Uh, we heard from Alec Neil again about the whole misunderstanding of what we're being asked to do. We're not being asked to, we're being asked to approve a bill which says that no one member state can unilaterally change the existing arrangements being transferred from... No, no, it doesn't give the UK the government the power to do that. It gives the... It, it says that 
the UK, the, the Europe, the, when the powers come back from the European Parliament to the Westminster Parliament, until the frameworks are agreed, no one country within the four member states can unilaterally change those arrangements. Presiding officer, we've been through an extended debate over the last few months. I understand and believe ultimately the suspicion that the Scottish Government is actually more motivated about producing further grievance to fight and justify an argument for independence. I'm surprised that the midwives of this argument have turned out to be Mr Scott and Mr Finlay. Shame on them. This afternoon, we should recognise that there is a whole argument to be had going forward about how we best represent Scotland's interests in the discussions that are going to take place. My single worry is that Mr Russell and the Scottish Government's actions have undermined the confidence and trust there will be in hearing Scotland's voice in those framework discussions as they proceed. That, I think, is the tragic outcome of this afternoon. We should support the LCM and allow Scotland to proceed. I call Michael Russell. Can you take us uh, to just before decision time, please, Minister? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, I have to say that uh, I doubt if there's ever been so much concern expressed for the people of Wales by the Scottish Conservatives, <laughs> or indeed by any Conservatives, I would suspect. And it's a charity that this afternoon even extended to the Lib Dem peers and finally to Lib Dem MPs. The only people the Scottish Conservatives don't appear to be concerned about is the people of Scotland. <laughs> the people of Scotland who voted in the vast majority for devolution in 1997, and let us remember, against the express wishes of the Scottish Conservatives. Yep. And that is the problem of this debate. The Scottish Conservatives have form in being against devolution. And again this afternoon, they have shown that form. Let me confirm to, um, to the Tor Tories that I do and did and still want this process of negotiation to lead to an agreement. But not any agreement and not at any price. And what we're being asked to do this afternoon is to accept any agreement at any price, or rather any Tory price. And I want to confirm the, uh, my agreement to the Labour amendment. I wrote to Richard Leonard yesterday to indicate what I would do at the conclusion of today's debate. And if this chamber chooses to, uh, reject, to confirm that it will not give legislative consent, I will write to David Liddington this evening, asking him to come to Scotland, to come to this parliament, and to meet the parties, including the Conservatives, uh, to sit down and to find, if it is possible, some new ways forward. And there have been ideas mentioned in this debate that are worth exploring. I thought Alec, Alec Neil made a very good distinction between UK government frameworks and UK frameworks. And although some of the proposals, for example, a way in which there could be a, a, a committee of ministers that was arbitrated, have already been raised in the House of Lords and defeated in the House of Lords, it is, it'll be worth exploring those, uh, those issues. So we will support the, the amendment at decision time and I will immediately act upon it uh, today. But let us suppose, for the sake of argument, that at the end of the day, the Tories impose their will upon this chamber. What would that mean? And I think if we stand back and look at what it would mean, we understand the enormity of this situation. Because what is being proposed is that the Tories in London, using the votes of the DUP, would hand the power of veto of the decisions of this parliament, this elected parliament, and this elected government to the Scottish Conservatives, to a minority within this chamber. That would be the effect of what took place. Because the Conservatives would be able to veto anything we chose to do for seven years. So this anti-democratic action benefits only the Conservatives. And they will use the votes of the DUP to essentially muzzle this Parliament. And that is not a price that we should pay. Now why would they, why would they do that? Why would they offer that uh, prize to the, the UK government and the UK Tories offer that prize to the Scottish Conservatives? We heard the answer this afternoon. It is in exchange for fanatical support for Brexit. These are people who were opposed to Brexit. Uh, Ruth Davidson demanded to continue in the single market and the customs union the day after the referendum. But we've heard not a single word of criticism of Brexit this afternoon, nor will we hear that. Because the way to success in the Conservative Party in Scotland 
is to be a born-again Brexiteer and to be an extreme born-again Brexiteer. And of course, the person who uh, takes to extremism like a duck to water is Murdo Fraser. He showed that this afternoon in his extreme view of Brexit. Now, this is regrettable. This is regrettable because it's doing damage to the, the very people that they exist to serve. And we heard an example of it this afternoon from Peter Chapman. At the very moment when Peter Chapman was speaking up for Brexit, the people that, to whom apparently he is closest, the National Farmers Union in Scotland, were issuing a press release talking about the ongoing uncertainty of Brexit, talking about the damage that Brexit would do to the agricultural community. So in actual fact, this is not this is not a victimless crime. Why the Tories attempt to grab power in this parliament, people, interests, organisations, businesses are suffering the chaos of the Tory Brexit and it is being backed by the Scottish Tories. So there are a whole range of misconceptions that we've heard this afternoon from the Tories, too many to go through in detail, but let me deal with three of them. First, that no present powers in this chamber are affected. Wrong. Let me just name three off the top of my head. Environmental protections, agricultural subsidy, protected geographical indicators. All, all, all affected. Secondly, that this is a debate uh, about the, an issue on the head of the pin. They're not real issues that touch people's lives. Food standards. Ross Finney's letter last week indicated that very strongly. Chemicals. My constituents in Mull who are trying to stop neonicotinoids coming into their water supply, that is affected. Yeah. And public procurement, public procurement that leads to thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of jobs in Scotland is affected. And finally, that Clause 11 is fine. There are no difficulties. It doesn't give any threat of any description. The words not normally are apparently the parachute that saves us all. Well, those words are not in the legislation. They have already been rubbished by the Advocate General. And the normality in the new Clause 11 is the overriding of the Scottish Parliament. That is yes, what is. the legislation says. Uh, Daniel Johnson talked about what is at stake in devolution, and he was right to do so, because a great deal is at stake in devolution. And what we have here is undoubtedly the worst challenge to devolution that we've had since 1999. And of course, devolution isn't just about us. Devolution is, and we should remember this, the Constitutional Steering Group paid attention to this. The Scottish Parliament said should embody and reflect the sharing of power between the people of Scotland, the legislators, and the Scottish executive. So devolution is actually about how we all work together for the benefit of Scotland. And I looked at the words of each of our first ministers as they uh, put forward their vision to be elected as first minister. I quoted Donald Dewar earlier in his opening remarks, but let me, let me quote each of the others. Henry McLeish, no, uh, no I'd like Mr. Finney, I want to finish. Henry McLeish on the 25th of October 2000. This parliament is about politics and of course we will have political differences, but our ultimate aim is the same, the best interests of our fellow Scots. That's what devolution is about. Jack McConnell on the 22nd of November 2002. On the day of the 1997 referendum, Scott voted yes because they wanted better politics and better government and they believed the Scottish Parliament would focus on their priorities. That was devolution. Alex Salmond on the 16th of May 2007. This Parliament is a Parliament of minorities where no one party rules without compromise or concession. It is about intelligent debate and mature discussion. That's devolution. And finally, Nicola Sturgeon, because there's, you can always do better, Mr. Finney, you can always aspire to do better, as we do. But I've been arguing this afternoon for what we have and how we use it. And I thought that was what something you wanted me to do. Now, Nicola Sturgeon, on the 19th of November 2014. Those whom we represent expect us to give our very best. All of us must ensure that we do not disappoint them. They expect us to debate vigorously, but they do not want us to divide. Let's work together to create a future for Scotland that is worthy of their dreams and their trust. A no, I won't. A future for Scotland that is worthy of their dreams and their trust. Not the demands, the narrow interests or Tory party factionalism of the UK government. Not the demands of Ruth Davidson so that she and her fellow members can veto 
what an elected government and an elected parliament decides. But a future for Scotland presiding officer that's worthy and dreams of the trust of the people we are here to serve, the Scottish people, who would not forgive us if we gave away the powers we are trying to use to improve Scotland. Thank you, and that concludes our debate on the European Union Withdrawal Bill UK legislation. We'll now move on to the next item of business, and the next item is a consideration of business motion 12253 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme for Thursday. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against this motion to say so now, and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you. And no one's asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 12253 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I think if members are... Although the chamber does look full, I'm going to wait till five o'clock to make sure that every member has a chance to be in the chamber for decision time. So I'm going to suspend for a minute and a half till five o'clock. Thank you. That is five o'clock. So we come now to decision time. And the first question this afternoon is that amendment one double, sorry, one treble two three point one in the name of Adam Tompkins, which seeks to amend motion one treble two three in the name of Michael Russell on the European Union Withdrawal Bill UK legislation be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12233.1 in the name of Adam Tompkins is yes, 30, no, 95. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 12233.2 in the name of Neil Findlay, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Michael Russell, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number one, treble two, three point two, in the name of Neil Findlay is yes, 93, no, 31. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion one, treble two, three, in the name of Michael Russell, as amended, on the European Union Withdrawal Bill, UK legislation be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Or not agreed? We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 1223 in the name of Michael Russell as amended is yes 93, no 30. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Point of order, Mr Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. This Parliament has now agreed that it does not consent to the EU withdrawal bill. This is a historic and significant moment for the Scottish Parliament and I hope with all sincerity that the UK Government will respect the views of this Parliament. In view of the decision, however, President Officer, taken by Parliament, would you now write to the Parliament's assemblies and legislators of the UK to inform them of our decision? Can I thank Mr Crawford for his advance notice of his point of order? And he is right to point out that this is a significant matter of interest to uh, all parts of the UK. Uh, I believe it would be appropriate for them to be made aware of uh, Parliament's decision this evening. And I will write to my counterparts at Westminster and the other UK legislatures to make them aware of the Parliament's position. Thank you. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Sandra White on NAGPA 70th anniversary. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. <laughs> 